Please be seated. This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. Good morning to all Honorable Members. We will pick up where we left off last evening. I now call upon the clerk. Item number six, presentation of papers. I call upon the Premier and Minister of Finance to lay his documents on the table. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in this honorable house to lay on the table the following documents uh, from 6A, Roman numeral one, statutory instrument 2021, number 16, and pro proclamation by His Excellency the Governor under section 83, subsection one, of the Resonance Constitution Order 2007, UK SI 2007, number 1678, appointing the time and place at which the sixth sitting of the third session of the fourth House of Assembly of the Resonance shall be held. Roman numeral number two, statutory instrument 2021, number 10, stamps, souvenir sheet, and first day cover, 95th birthday of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Order 2021, three. Department uh, Roman numeral three, Department of Human Resources Annual Report 2018, Roman numeral four, Department of Human Resources Annual Report 2019, Roman numeral five, Statutory Instrument 2020 number 148, Imposition of a Curfew number 41, Order 2020, Roman numeral six, Statutory Instrument 2021 number five, Imposition of a Curfew Order 2021. Roman numeral seven, statutory instrument 2021, number seven, in position of a curfew, number two, order 2021. Roman numeral number eight, statutory instrument 2021, number 12, in position of a curfew, order number three, order 2021. And Roman numeral nine, statutory instrument 2021, number 17, in position of a curfew, order number four, in, uh, curfew number four, order 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Pursuant to, the, pursuant to the Curfew Act of 2017, Section 3.2, the floor is now open for debate on statutory instrument numbers 148, number 5, number 7, number 12, and number 17. With no member wishing to debate, I call upon the Minister for Natural. Okay, I call on behalf of the Deputy Premier, the Premier and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Premier will be here very shortly as he's attending the debate with the students. So on his behalf, Mr. Speaker, I lay on the table the following documents. Roman numeral one, Department of Youth Affairs and Sports Annual Report 2018. Roman numeral two, Public Library Services Department Annual Report 2018. And Roman numeral three, Ministry of Education and Culture Annual Report 2018. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration to lay his documents on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The speaker arrives to lay the following papers on the table. Roman numeral one, Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor Annual Report 2018. Roman numeral two, Ministry of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration Annual Report 2019. Roman numeral three, Land and Survey Department Survey Unit Annual Report 2018. Roman numeral four, Land and Survey Department Survey Unit Annual Report 2019, Roman numeral 5, Land and Survey Department Lands Unit Annual Report 2019, 6, Roman numeral 6, Department of Immigration Annual Report 2018, Roman numeral 7, Department of Immigration Annual Report 2019, Roman numeral 8, Statutory Instrument 2021 number 4, Immigration and Passport Prohibition of Entry Order 2021, Roman numeral 9, Statutory Instrument 2021, number 9, Immigration Passport, Prohibition of Entry Amendment Order 2021, and Roman numeral 10, Statutory Instrument 
2021, number 14, statutory rates, fees, and charges, amendment of schedule, order 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for laying his documents. I call upon the Minister for Health and Social Development to lay his documents on the table. Thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to lay on the table the following documents. Statutory Instrument 2020, number 149, Public Health, COVID-19 Control and Suppression Measures, number 9, Amendment number 3, Order of 2020. Mr. Speaker, also Statutory Instrument 2021, number 6, Public Health, COVID-19 Control and Suppression Measures, number 9, Amendment Order 2021, and number 3, Mr. Speaker, Statutory Instrument 2021, number 15, Public Health, COVID-19 Control and Suppression Measures, number 9, Amendment number 2, Order 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank all ministers for laying their documents. I call upon the clerk. Number eight, questions and answers to questions. No, we had, we had um, renumbered the paper where we've taken statement by ministers before the questions. So, speaker. Statements, item number eight, statements by ministers. Actually, that'll be item number seven. Okay, statement by ministers. I recognize the Premier and Minister of Finance and member for the first district, the Honorable <coughs> Andrew A. Foy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I only have two uh, brief statements. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for allowing me to say uh, and uh, uh, update this Honorable House. The first statement, Mr. Speaker, is on the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry. Mr. Speaker, I now wish to update this Honorable House on what is happening at the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry as it marks the transformational period for shipping in the Virgin Islands, a moment that we are using to celebrate all our accomplishments in transforming our industry towards international standards, while appreciating that there is much more to do to attract tonnage and boost the economy. Mr. Speaker, I will take you on a voyage as I discuss your government's plan for shipping in the Virgin Islands. Your government has refused to adopt the ship has sailed mentality. Thus, we went back to the drawing board to revamp and reform the shipping industry in the Virgin Islands, and I am proud to give you an update today. It was about just a year and a half ago at the launch of the back to the seas marine industry training program at HLSEC that I told you that the marine sector is one of the BVI's most valuable assets, but its potential is untapped and underexploited. Commercial maritime activity is already huge in the BVI. It spans small tourism crafts to large shipping vessels, as well as marinas, docks, ports, infrastructure, and the service such as hospitality and technical services that support them. It is, an area, uh, it is an area that has a very wide scope, much wider than many people realize. Though commercial maritime activity is already huge in the Virgin Islands, there's lots of room for growth. We boast the title sailing capital of the world. So it is only fitting that we reform and invest more in our shipping industry so that it reaches its full potential and beyond. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry is the agency responsible for ensuring that all international maritime conventions are maintained. And more than ever, it is crucial that we maintain our Category 1 General Register status of British ships within the Red Ensign Group and other international certifications received. Shipping Registry has received and is in the process of receiving several international certifications. And moreover, these certifications are one step in ensuring that we remain competitive and maintain international standards. We want our clientele to have the most confidence 
in our product and service. I must say that we are poised to perfect all the processes in all of the maritime conventions to subsequently dominate the shipping realm. My role as Minister of Finance is to ensure that the finances of the Virgin Islands are allocated appropriately, and shipping is an area that was in the need of much improvement. Mr. Speaker, this is why your government collectively has invested in the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry. The Cabinet of the Virgin Islands approved funding for the marketing, human resources, technological tools, and other resources to improve the registry. There are many economic reasons why we need to reform shipping. For far too long, we have been dependent on two major economic pillars, financial services and tourism. And though we are blessed to enjoy the fruits of the labor of those who came before us, your government is here to ensure that the necessary advancements are made to allow the Virgin Islands to enjoy a stable economy going forward. Our vision is to transform the Virgin Islands in, into a leading regional economy through entrepreneurship, innovation, and local and foreign investment. And our shipping industry will be an integral part of this. Mr. Speaker, again, I said to you, the people of the Virgin Islands, nothing your government is doing for you is in isolation. Everything is inherently linked to ensure that we prosper as a destination and jurisdiction. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry offers very competitive registration and annual maintenance fees and hosts a technical support team that meets all international standards. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry certifies certificates are recognized worldwide. This means that any citizen or body corporate of the United Kingdom, its crown dependencies and overseas territories, or of a member state of the European community, community European economic area, bodies corporate incorporated in a member state of the Caribbean community, or the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, qualifies to register a ship in the British Virgin Islands. For those who do not qualify directly, the usual practice is to incorporate a British Virgin Islands business company to act as the owner. So you see, Mr. Speaker, here shipping is linked to our financial services product. The registration of vessels is important to our financial services and tourism economies. There is economic diversity where vessels can register in BVI through company registry. This then leads to a spin-off for the global tourism market. We have thousands of vessels on our flag currently, and the majority of our clientele is recreational, including large commercial mega yachts. But we do also have commercial vessels on our flag. It is important that we continue to improve our product offering to leverage and expand the services we provide to our clients and to attract other categories of vessels, larger vessels, tankers, bulk carriers, container ships, and one day perhaps even cruise ships. Mr. Speaker, vessels that have never come to the BVI can be registered here. And perhaps we can structure our substance requirements to make it beneficial for shipping companies to have operational and or management functions and offices in the British Virgin Islands. And it is one of the avenues that your government will continue to promote as a revenue stream. Mr. Speaker, we must remain competitive as large countries have done and embrace modern trends aimed at attracting tonnage for economic growth and prestige. As we continue the reopening of our tourism industry in this new regular of living and working with COVID-19, diversification of our tourism product is important. Shipping is another avenue that we intend to use to achieve this. We cannot deny that one of our large, biggest attractions here in the Virgin Islands is our pristine waters, and we must capitalize on the interest of persons coming to enjoy our waters for leisure. Boaters are coming to enjoy our small cluster of islands with secluded anchorages, splendid beaches, world-class marine industry, favorable trade winds, stunning pristine land and seascapes. 
This will have a positive impact on our tourism industry as more in companies, restaurateurs, hoteliers, supermarkets, local stores, shuttle services, taxi operators, taxi drivers, operators, fuel companies will all benefit from this economic activity. Mr. Speaker, all Virgin Islanders have the opportunity to have a stake in this industry. As the industry continues to grow, there will be need for expansions of docks, moorings, and other infrastructure, which will further boost our construction industry. Additionally, there also will be a need for captains, deckhands, engineers, stewards, chefs, naval architects, maritime consultants, and more. This is why your government has invested in its people first through the Maritime Industry Training Program at the HS Tau Community College so that the future of the Virgin Islands is prepared to dominate this industry. The Maritime Training Program is progressing well as we are now on our second cohort of students, which include females. I thank the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Board of Directors, President and Staff of HS Tau Community College and the industry partners who serve as sponsors for management and success of this program thus far. I am pleased to say that very soon we will have several trained and experienced human resources to support on the ground and on the water here at our home port. Despite the state of the world, we have not battened down our hatches. The Virgin Islands remains poised as a sailing mecca. We are open for business. In terms of the future of the shipping industry in the Virgin Islands, I'm happy and energized about the new prospects, and I hope that you are too. Mr. Speaker, our registry is modernizing its services, service offerings, and is in the process of revamping its online presence to better suit the needs of its clientele. The suite of e-government legislation will enhance the services to be provided. This is why we will be moving towards privatizing the shipping registry as a statutory body. We expect that this will further improve service quality, increase efficiency and innovation, improve maintenance, and allow us as policymakers to steer rather than rule. While we recognize that our marine industry is big business, it has the potential to grow even bigger. And your government, together with the team at the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry, BISR, is working to put the necessary things in place for us to unlock this potential. Recognizing this reality, the team at Virgin Islands Shipping Registry has been working on a rigorous timetable. And I must say that the director of the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry Mr. John Samuel has been pushing, and I'm pleased that the Premier's office has been providing the much needed policy support to help the team stay ahead of projected targets. With the cooperation and commitment, and that of your government and public officers across all ministries, departments, and agencies, cabinet, house of assembly, the business community, we have managed to work together to get the shipping registry moving forward. Each agency plays an instrumental role in us maintaining our stake in the industry internationally. We also thank the Deputy Governor's Office and the Governor's Office for the role they have played as well in this process so far. I want to especially thank the Administrative Arm through the Premier's Office for pushing beyond the limit to make things happen. Mr. Speaker, your government brought different pieces of legislation to the House of Assembly, like the Merchant Shipping Act, for example, to strengthen the industry in many ways. Mr. Speaker, this government has been bringing forward maritime policies, covering shipping operations, safety of life at sea, security and the prevention of and responses to pollution from ships. We have been bringing forward legislation to implement and enforce the regulations applicable to all Virgin Islands vessels on both domestic and international routes and for all vessels navigating in the waters of the Virgin Islands. Your government is committed to ensuring that we continually, as an economy, develop and adapt appropriate standards of training, evaluation and certification for Virgin Islands seafarers, 
and onshore staff in accordance with the respective needs of international and domestic shipping and the BVI maritime industry. Shipping has made some remarkable achievements within the last few months. Mr. Speaker, the BVI as a maritime nation is authorized via international maritime conventions extended to us by the United Kingdom. Before the conventions can be extended, the UK verifies that BVI has the legislation and administration in place to execute those conventions. This is where the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry fits in. The Maritime Administration of the Virgin Islands and therefore directly responsible for most matters of maritime safety and navigation. In very simple layman terms, Virgin Islands Shipping Registry is responsible for anything in and around the BVI waters that are not alive. Boats, buoys, charts, and things like that. If it is in or on the water and you are not sure, call the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry. This maritime administration consists of a team that is perhaps the most quali highly qualified maritime and registration professionals in the Caribbean. Many persons may not be aware, but right here, right here at the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry on staff, there's a full team of marine surveyors and they are able to handle any task of any size or configuration. It is, more, it is important that our potential global clients are aware of this. And locally, they now have ship owners with significant fleet investment. And we would like them to be aware that our Virgin Islands Shipping Registry can handle their business right here in the Virgin Islands. There is no need to go halfway across the world to register your vessel. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry can provide its clients with a quality flag and the services and certification to support that flag and support your vessels and your shipping operations. And they can save money while doing so. Surveyors are right here in the British Virgin Islands. In 2020, Shipping Registry was awarded Qual ship status by the U.S. Coast Guard. Honor. In other words, our BVI vessels, when checked in U.S. ports, have consistently met or exceeded the requisite international maritime standards. Mr. Speaker, this is important because it is evidence that Virgin Islands Shipping Registry can provide quality certification to support the needs of mariners and instills industry confidence in us. That was a 2020 accomplishment, and they have many more on the horizon. But today, Mr. Speaker, I wish to highlight with great joy our ISO 9001-2015 achievement. Mr. Speaker, you may ask, what is ISO? ISO is the International Organization for Standardization, which is an independent, non-governmental, international organization that develops standards to ensure the quality, safety, and efficiency of products, services, and systems. The organization, the organization develops standards in order to certify businesses or organizations. ISO 9001 is among ISO's best known standards, and it defines the criteria for meeting a number of quality management principles. It helps businesses and organizations be more efficient and improve customer satisfaction. The final number in an ISO certification refers to the version of the standard that's been met and is represented by the calendar year in which those standards were launched. 2015 is the fifth edition of ISO 9001. It was launched in September 2015. Certification is done by an approved ISO certifying body, and each applicant is subject to an audit to verify compliance prior to being certified. And organizations are required to be audited annually to verify the operational presence of the requisite management systems. In January and February 2021, Virgin Islands Shipping Registry was audited 
by Global Compliance Services, a certifying body based in the United States of America. This audit was completed over a two-week period during which our entire management system was reviewed. This involved a document review of all shipping registries, manuals, and procedures, and interviews with key line managers to verify knowledge of the systems and commitment to quality standards and organizational growth and compliance. Global Compliance Services has verified that our management system, our services, and our documentation procedures here at the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry have all, and I repeat, have all met the requirements for standardization and quality assurance. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to report to this honorable house that the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry is now ISO 9001 certified in accordance with the 2015 standards, ISO 9001-2015. And we are now one of the BVI's industry leaders, an equivalent to our pairs and flags globally having in place an internationally accredited management system. This guarantees our clients in the BVI a globally efficient service, customer satisfaction, consistency and quality across our various products and services. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry is a member of the Red Enzyme Group of the United Kingdom flags. This group, which includes the United Kingdom's presence via the United Kingdom Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, commonly called the MCA, is world-renowned as a group of quality British flags bolstered by British maritime law. This affords our clients hassle-free transit into and out of foreign ports and the ability for vessel financiers to secure mortgages on the BVI ship's register similar to the method used to document mortgages and liens on lands and property. Mr. Speaker, this accomplishment is huge, and to this I say to God be all the glory. Mr. Speaker, boats, ships, and vessel mortgages on the BVI register are secure. Our legislation in this area has been in existence for many years and is currently in use by many BVI clients whose vessels are trading in various ports globally. Mr. Speaker, many of these vessels you may not see in the BVI, but they fly the BVI flag and carry the name of one of our BVI registration ports, Road Harbor, White Bay, or Garda Song, on their sterns or transoms as they sail globally. We wish to highlight that this is not just for international clients, but these options, facilities, and services are available to our BVI financial institutions and BVI-based clients as well. Shipping registry success model includes the facilitation of more BVI-based marine mortgages, allowing us the opportunity to convert more of the BVI resident fleet to the BVI flag and supporting new symbiotic biotic avenues across the BVI economies. Our desire is to support the BVI maritime commercial, recreational, and tourism products, and to see our BVI red ensign, the red BVI flag with the vigilante in the top corner, flying on every boat based in the BVI. To achieve this, we require the cooperation of the banks, brokers, agents and lawyers, and this is a discussion that we will be arranging to have. A discussion that will improve industry awareness of our BVI brand, our BVI flag, and the resilience and security of the BVI registration product. Further, at the shipping registry, they are already had at work and knee deep in policy development to enhance the benefits and opportunities of flagging BVI and to create owner benefits and tangible economic links between our commercial recreational maritime industries and BVI flagged vessels. Mr. Speaker, in simple terms, we aim to create processing and financial advantages to boats that have flagged BVI and wish to utilize the BVI commercial recreational tourism product. Our flag has a role to play in strengthening our economy, securing our economic base, and reducing the broad-scale export of liquid financial assets from our economy. 
We will be forging stronger relationships with our financial industry in support of these goals. Many additional financial and marketing benefits can result from further expansion of our fleet of registered vessels, not only in volume, but also in vessel size and type. As a maritime nation, the BVI is subject to verification of compliance under the International Maritime Organization's Instrument Implementation Code, commonly called the Triple I Code. This code highlights the key elements required to demonstrate compliance with all International Maritime Organization IMO conventions. Compliance is verified via an IMO audit which is scheduled for mid-year for UK flags. Mr. Speaker, in short, in order for the BVI to operate, it operate its flag registration and for BVI ports to accept and trade unrestrictedly, the BVI must adhere to and implement the maritime conventions that we have agreed to. In the BVI, the conventions are implemented across various government departments and agencies, including the Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, responsible for maritime radio communication, the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, who currently leads search and rescue in the BVI waters, SAR Convention, the Ministry of Natural Resources with responsibility for maritime pollution, Marpool Convention, BVI Ports Authority and Virgin Islands Shipping Registry, who has overall oversight and responsibility for maritime matters in the BVI waters, SOLAS, and STCW conventions. It is important that we understand these things and that there's an awareness of not only what we are doing, but why the BVI is doing these things. We are aware that greater dissemination of information is required and additional, additional public education on the maritime affairs of the BVI. There are requirements that have to be met. We may have not been fully compliant, but we have ramped up our preparation and development significantly in the third and fourth quarters of 2020. Mr. Speaker, through the tremendous and overwhelming support of this government, the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry has been keeping Cabinet busy with policy decisions, legislative and procedural adjustments, and requests for financial financing to support this effort. The public would have become aware of a recent cabinet decision regarding the establishment of a rescue coordination center. This is one clear example of improvements that are not optional to ensure our compliance and our ability to continue to operate an unrestricted flag and unrestricted ports. In this example, BVI as a maritime nation is required to broadcast marine weather forecasts, navigational warnings, maintain radio watch for distress calls on various frequencies, manage traffic in territorial waters, manage search and res re rescue cases in accordance with SOLAS standards, among others. This we have not been doing. The Rescue Coordination Center will certify this issue, improve the safety standard of BVI waters to the internationally required standard, and close this gap. There are many additional shortcomings that we have rectified over the past few months, and others that are still in progress. Mr. Speaker, expect to hear and see more of the shipping registry over the coming months as we enter our final preparation stages and advance various developments that are required for our success and the BVI's long-term success. The Virgin Islands Shipping Registry is on target at a critical time in our growth. The team is leading growth and change and to advance, recreate and prepare our maritime industries for tomorrow is exciting work. This is a time of opportunity for the business of shipping and flagging with the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, our path is not complete as we approach a UK mock audit in late March or early April, and the IMO III code audit in the third quarter. But we have made so many improvements, so many improvements in the BVI maritime space in these past months. I extend a heartfelt thank you.
to the staff of the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry on behalf of my government and I, who this Virgin Islands Shipping Industry staff, who has taken us far along this journey. The team has already made sterling progress in bringing us to where we need to be. They worked night and day during the Christmas holidays to ensure that the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry was able to achieve ISO 9001-2015 certification, a task that the naysayers said was impossible, but which was achieved in record time with God's help. Anything is possible when you put your mind to it. And when Virgin Islanders resolve to achieve something, there's nothing that can stop our indomitable spirit. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have another short statement. Very well. Which I thank you for. And it's my last statement for the day. Mr. Speaker, this statement is entitled, Your Government Working for You. Mr. Speaker, even two years into office. And it's to update this honorable house of your, some of your government's progress. So I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me the opportunity to address this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, on 25th February 2019, the people of the Virgin Islands went to the polls in peaceful, free and fair elections and elected a new government. Their decision in that democratic process afforded me the honor of serving as the premier of these beautiful Virgin Islands, and for the members of my team to be appointed as ministers and junior ministers in the government of the Virgin Islands. It goes without saying that the people's expectations of their government includes efficient, effective, and proactive governance, the prudent management of the resources of the Virgin Islands, and responsible decision-making that safeguards and promotes the welfare of the people of the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, there is also an expectation, as well as a commitment from your government, to be transparent in public affairs and accountable for our stewardship. 24 months is a short time, considering the amount of work that needed to be done, and which needs to be done, to bring us to the point where we should be at this stage in the life of the Virgin Islands. And the time has been even shorter given the challenges of COVID-19, which challenges have affected not only us in the Virgin Islands, but people and economies around the world. In the 2020 and 2021 budget addresses, I detail the work done by your government in the respective preceding years and how the prevailing issues would have affected your government's agenda, both on the legislative side and the fiscal side. The budget address and other ministerial statements are just one avenue through which your government has been accounting to the people. Mr. Speaker, glossing over the past 24 months, you would recall briefly that in 2019, your government invested our efforts in getting the overdue, the overdue 2019 and 2020 budgets passed and re-engaging with our international cruise partners, among other things. We were, of course, constrained by having to work with the 2019 budget that was framed by our predecessors. All said, the Virgin Islands was poised to have a favorable 2020. The 1,000 jobs and 1,000 days program in partnership with local businesses was in place. We rolled out a number of training programs in collaboration with the HL South Community College, HLSCC, such as the Marine Training Program and the more recent Solar Training Program to equip our people to take advantage of lucrative opportunities, both present and emerging. Tourist arrivals were returning to pre armor levels and business were picking up. Our recovery was well on the way. But then the COVID-19 pandemic appeared in March 2020, and the public health restrictions required to keep everyone safe from the novel coronavirus put a damper on some of the progress we had made. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that your government had to focus on managing the public health, economic and social implications of COVID-19. We had to upgrade our healthcare infrastructure, commission a certified lab to improve the efficiency of conducting COVID-19 tests, provide food and other necessities to the needy and the vulnerable, 
implement measures to further strengthen our border security, prepare and execute economic stimulus packages, and put measures in place to begin the reopening of our tourism industry in a managed way. The soundness of the decisions taken by your government, the work done with respect to managing COVID-19, and our collective sacrifices are evident in the number of lives saved and the fact that the economy has been spared critical damage. Had we not acted decisively, had we not taken the difficult decisions, the damage to the economy would have been much worse and would have jeopardized any hope of recovery when the COVID-19 threat subsides. This is your government working for the people of the Virgin Islands. The fact that COVID-19 vaccines are becoming available brings optimism that the wheels of the global economy will begin turning once again. So we must hold on to hope and to our faith in God that brighter days are ahead. Mr. Speaker, this does not mean that we must stop being vigilant. We have to operate with caution until the COVID-19 threat is abated to the point where the restrictions on international travel can be sufficiently relaxed. In the meantime, we must keep our focus on the vision of transforming the Virgin Islands into a leading regional economy through entrepreneurship, innovation, and local and foreign investment, strengthening our resilience to economic shocks and catastroph catastroph catastrophic events, and continuing our advancement towards self-determination. It is in this regard that I wish to remind this Honorable House and the Virgin Islands public of some of the targets that your government has set for the period ahead. Honorable members will recall from the speech from the throne that your government indicated our intentions to bring forward a number of pieces of legislation to further strengthen good governance in the Virgin Islands. These are commitments that we made in our manifesto. This is not anything that we are being made to do by anyone. It is something that we have been constantly committed to doing because it is a part of our belief and values as Virgin Islanders. Your government has caused to be drafted an Integrity in Public Life Act and Ministerial Code of Conduct will soon be before Cabinet and which we expect to bring this, these, uh, this Honorable House, bring to this Honorable House once it has gone through cabinet. A new procurement act is being worked on to further strengthen accountability and transparency in public procurement. We, you would be aware that the contractor general legislation and whistleblower legislation already had their first reading in this honorable house and will be followed by public consultation. The police act had its first reading in this honorable house and this too will go through the public consultation process. Your government is fully in favor of good governance legislation. It is clear from our actions that this government is not wavering when it comes to further strengthening good governance. We fully support transparency and accountability. Resilient and effective institutions and governance systems are very important for advancing the Virgin Islands in our journey to self-determination as well as for further strengthening the confidence of local and foreign investors, but more so for strengthening the confidence in each other. They are also important for protecting the rights of our people and ensuring that taxpayers' money and trust are not abused. In our continued commitment to climate change and taking climate resilient actions, your government is also preparing to bring forward amendments to the Customs Act to revise the framework for export tax so that we can generate revenues from exports and to extend the zero tax on renewable energy equipment for a specific period of time. We have to continue pushing the transition to green energy in the Virgin Islands. This is innovation and this is progress, but most of this is your government working for you. We will also continue to further strengthen our disaster management structures so that they are on par with that of the Health Emergency Operations Center, which continues to manage the COVID-19 pandemic with excellence. That is why your government has funded the construction of the new National Emergency Operations Center. We have already broken ground for construction of a new 
more fit for purpose and resilient building for the Department of Disaster Management, DDM, and the National Emergency Operations Center, NEOC. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to ownership, all Virgin Islands people must be able to own their own homes. The young people of the territory have expressed that home ownership is something they are very interested in. Due to this express demand, your government will be extending the stamp duty waiver for the purchase of property by belongers. This amendment has re already received its first reading in the House of Assembly. This is progress. This is your government working for you. During the upcoming year, it is our aim to bring legislation to merge the BVI Airports Authority and the BVI Ports Authority into a single entity. This will reduce the operations costs for these two bodies, thereby improving efficiency and effectiveness, which will lead to an increase in revenue. This is innovation. This is progress. This is your government working for you. We also plan to bring forward the legislation for the Water and Sewage Department and Virgin Islands Shipping Registry to each become statutory bodies. This will help these departments to become more profitable and efficient, marketable and competitive. This is an innovation, this is progress, and this is your government working for you. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that your government has also slated the e-government's suite of legislation for consideration by this Honorable House. The suite of e-government legislation includes but not, are not limited to Data Protection Act, Electronic Transfer of Funds Act, Electronic Filing Act, and Electronic Transactions Act. These different acts will make it more convenient for residents from District 1 to District 9 and abroad to conduct business with the government of the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that all of these pieces of legislation had their first reading in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, they are now passed by this Honorable House. This is progress. This is your government working for you. The Virgin Islands Investment Act and Business Licensing Act 2020 have already been introduced in this Honorable House for first reading. These legislation will further strengthen the already passed Virgin Islands Trade Commission legislation and significantly improve the ease of doing business in the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, your government has two very capable junior ministers who are passionate about service to their country and to the people of the Virgin Islands. They continue to work hard in their respective roles and they have the confidence and support of their ministerial colleagues. Junior Minister for Trade, Honorable Shireen Flax-Shaws, will be spearheading the work with regard to the Virgin Islands Investment Act and the Business Licensing Act 2020. This includes holding a series of public meetings accompanied by the requisite government authorities to gather the public's input into these historic pieces of legislation that will revolutionize the way trade and investment are done in this territory. Additionally, the Junior Minister for Tourism, Honorable Shari De Castro, is leading the Special Tourism Committee to complete the National Tourism Plan, and we have it already and have it ready for the next budget cycle. This committee has representatives from all the stakeholder groups and all the sister islands. Mr. Speaker, I've heard one or two persons asking why. Why give these responsibilities to these female junior ministers? And my answer is in this modern 21st century, why not? Mr. Speaker, International Women's Day was on the 8th of March where we locally celebrated the self-determination of women and their continued positive impact and contribution towards the development of the Virgin Islands. Since the inception of the junior minister's position, persons functioning in that role spearheaded several government initiatives and projects on behalf of the Premier, hence assigning the two capable female junior ministers the task previously mentioned is quite appropriate and expected. And I salute them and pledge my full support as they execute projects on behalf of the Premier in the area of tourism, trade, and economic development. Mr. Speaker, our Junior Minister for Trade and our Junior Minister for Tourism are two dynamic, capable, and hard-working women. They have the ability and they are willing to work. The government ministers are supported by teams of proficient and knowledgeable public officers 
and our junior ministers have the support and commitment of their respective teams. So to say that they should not be allowed to roll up their sleeves and work for the people simply because they are not in the cabinet is absurd. Mr. Speaker, our development and the, indeed the modern world of globalization have outgrown many of the restrictions contained in our constitution. And therefore, the constitutional review exer exercise is, an urge, is as urgent as it is necessary. I continue to urge members of the public to prepare themselves for this exercise. Read and discuss the Constitution among yourselves and with your families. Be critical in your reflections. Look at what works for the Virgin Islands and what does not work for the Virgin Islands. Our new Constitution must be informed by the vision that all people hold for themselves. So we need the people of the Virgin Islands to tell us what they want in the Constitution and what they do not want. And we must bear in mind that the Constitution will be our guiding document for at least the next 10 years, and that this exercise transcends political parties and personalities. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that Cabinet recently approved the framework for which will guide the structure of the Constitutional Review. Mr. Speaker, recently, your government has also approved a framework to guide the National Development Sustainable Planning Initiative. This will be the roadmap for our territory's development. Everything we do in terms of development, whether it is infrastructure or the economy, will be linked back to this master plan. Mr. Speaker, indeed this is innovation and this is progress. And this is your government working for you. Your government will be holding many public meetings from District 1 to 9 so that the people of the Virgin Islands will have an opportunity to give their input on how they want their BVI to look and perform within the next 10, 15, 20 years under this National Sustainable Development Plan. Your government has established a number of committees to advise on how to improve the efficiency of the public service operations and chart our economic and development, including diversification. On the advice of the new Acting Financial Secretary, Mr. Jeremiah Fred, we have established a special in-house finance advisory committee, which is comprised of officers from across the ministries and statutory bodies. The committee's mandate is to identify ways to save the territory money by cutting unnecessary expenditure and to find new ways to generate revenues, including new industries. We have also assembled a special committee consisting of retired senior public officers to review the recurrent expenditure and to make recommendations for how we can lower government expenses. We have a wealth of experience among our people. We have people who have BBI love for our country and who want to see us progress as a people. This is one of the, our most valuable and often unrecognized strengths in the Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, indeed this is innovation and this is progress and this is your government working for you. Mr. Speaker, your government has also established a committee from the private sector to examine what new industries are a good fit for the BVI. BVI Financial Services is also being very proactive in recognizing the changes in the global finance markets and is pursuing innovation to harness the opportunities that are emerging. Your government is also pressing forward with a number of projects that will create jobs and other economic opportunities and development opportunities while improving the quality of life for all residents and stimulating economic activity. For instance, we will be moving forward with the Palm Grove complex in partnership with private entities. We will also be prioritizing the redevelopment of Prospect Reef. This is progress, and this is your government working for you. Your government will continue the rehabilitation of the Ralph T. O'Neill Central Administration complex. We will continue repairs to government-owned satellite offices which will make services more accessible to residents of uh, outer lying air communities and enhance the work environment of various public offices and ensure increased services offered. Other projects will include construction of the halls of justice, repairs to the police stations at, station at Anigata and Rotong, rehabilitative works to the police marine base, construction of a new facility to house the police headquarters and Rotong police station, completion of ongoing outfitting works to custom headquarters and other related facilities, continuing renovation works at the Rotong Fire Station, 
Mr. Speaker, this is progress. This is your government working for you. Your government aims to further tourism infrastructure development. This includes pursuing the King Island Bay revitalization project, rehabilitating visitor centers across the territory, and enhancing the tourism product at the Copper Mine Point ruins on Virgin Garda. This is your government working for you. We will continue work on restoring our ferry terminals and jetties. This includes continuing work on the Western Sofa's whole ferry terminal to develop a modern, technologically driven entry port facility to accommodate over 200,000 passengers per year and to provide an entry port that is resilient and which follows international safety and smart standards while providing opportunities for the people of the territory. Mr. Speaker, this is your government working for you. Development of the Anigara Setting Point Jetty will continue to ensure international port standards and enhance the opportunities for residents of Anigara. Redevelopment of the dark hole facilities and the dock at the Justin Dyke, at Justin Dyke will also continue. We will be moving forward with the East End Fat Hogs Bay Harbour project and dredging of the Seacoast Bay Harbour to facilitate moorings for ferries and yachts. Mr. Speaker, this is progress. This is your government working for you. The BVI Ports Authority is working on putting the measures in place for reopening of sea borders to international tourism traffic. The targeted open, opening date is 15 April 2021, and the authority is providing weekly updates. The Anigata Hybrid Renewable Energy and Battery Energy Storage System project as scheduled to be completed in the third quarter of this year. It will improve the electricity supply and quality of service on uh, the sister island and help in the transition away from fossil fuel to green, renewable, sustainable energy. Other sustainable energy projects are under consideration. Mr. Speaker, renovations to the Water and Sewage Department buildings and the Public Works Department buildings at Bargas Bay will continue. We'll also be reconfiguring the compound to expand the facilities and improve service delivery. We will also be rehabilitating the facilities at Water Depot in Virgin Gorda. Mr. Speaker, targeted improvements to the water network infrastructure include upgrades to reservoirs at Long Bush, Zion Hill, and Caribbean, and installation of new water meters to improve efficiency. This is your government working for you. The long-awaited and long-overdue Eastern Long Oak Sewage Project has commenced and will continue. We will also be pressing forward with the King Allen Bay Sewage Project and the Rotong Sewage Project in a phased manner. Through the territory-wide gut rehabilitation and development program, guts throughout the territory will be cleared of debris so, that, so they can function effectively. We are also working on major road repairs project, including repairs to Nail Bay Road, Johnson God Road, Long Bay Road, Ballast Bay Road, and King Adam Bay Road, just to name a few. Road stabilization and retaining walls construction projects include Great Mountain, Long Trench, Hope Hill, Little Dix Hill, and Fort Hill. Work in some of these areas is already underway. Sea defense projects for the northern side of Tortola will commence this year. These include areas such as Caribbean, Little Apple Bay, just to name a few. This is your government working for you. The BVI Airport Authority is preparing to put forward a plan for the expansion of the airport at Beef Island so that we can improve our positioning as an air transportation hub, accommodate larger aircraft and direct flights from major cities, and expand our tourism sector. This project is projected to span three to five years. Your government is prioritizing the needs of our children and we allocate funding for the construction and development of the Jocelyn Dyke Primary School and the Isabella Morris Primary School with assistance from donors. The architect is already had at work. Mr. Speaker, rehabilitation and reconstruction work are ongoing at the Brigada Flax Educational Center, restoring the functionality of that secondary school and providing access to public education on Virgin Garda. The renovation work to the John E. George Administration Building has been already completed and has been turned over to government to provide services to the public. 
The Vanderpool and Flax building in the Valley Virgin Guard are currently under renovation. The Jeffrey Keynes basketball arena and surrounding areas are currently undergoing repairs. The Anagat administration building is currently being repaired. This is progress, Mr. Speaker. This is your government working for you. Your government will undertake this year development of a modern center for the performing arts theater to assist with developing, preserving, and promoting BVI's heritage of dance, music, and all other forms of artistic expression while fostering the growth of cultural tourism. We will continue upgrading the basketball courts and other sporting and recreational facilities throughout the territory, as well as a multi-purpose sports complex and the Virgin Garda Sports Complex. Repairs and remedial works at the King Anime Community Center and the Eastern Longlook Community Center are also cadre to take place. Mr. Speaker, your government is working. Our technocrats and our public officers across all ministries, departments, and statutory bodies are working. The Attorney General Office is working. There's a lot that is happening and more that will be unfolding in the upcoming months to create additional ec economic opportunities for our Virgin Islands people. Your government has launched the BVI Love e-magazine to help our people stay informed of what is happening in the territory and so that they can be aware of upcoming opportunities for them to participate in and benefit from. Two magazines have already been published, one on January 25th, the second on February 25th. And within the next, the, the, with the next one to follow on March 25th. As we further strengthen our governance system, our economy, and our people, we are preparing the BVI for a new, brighter, and more resilient future. We cannot just live for today, and your government cannot just govern for today. We have to prepare ourselves and our generations for the future. The future belongs to the prepared. I always remind us that the eyes of the future are watching back at us, hoping that we get it right. And the eyes of the past are looking ahead at us, hoping that we do not get it wrong. The duty lies with us today to do our part to make as much preparation as we possibly can. And your government is working today with the future in mind. Mr. Speaker, this is your government working for you. I thank you. I thank the Honorable Premier for his statements, and I'm sure that you have copies now available for all Honorable Members. I recognize the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalio D. Wheatley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to share with this honorable house and the entire community updates on the progress in schools since the start of the 2020-2021 school year and into the second term. We have been doing our utmost to have the schools function as close to normal as possible. So we have been encouraging a return to a series of our, can of our annual calendar of events. Most schools have completed sports day events. And at the end of this week, we will have the inter-primary school competition. We have made some major adjustments to the number of students representing their schools, from over 40 to 8 during this COVID period. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the counselors during Counselors Week, and yesterday several schools celebrated Commonwealth Day, or a couple days ago. Mr. Speaker, all schools have been observing the COVID-19 protocols established by the Ministry of Health and approved by Cabinet, such as having extra wash stations for the washing of hands and classrooms equipped with sanitation stations for students. The six feet social distancing guidelines are in place in all schools. Classes are conducted on all campuses utilizing the phased approach. 
except in the cases of schools with small numbers, such as Ivan Dawson, Claudia Cricky, and Joss Van Dyke Primary School, where all students attend classes daily on campus. Schools implemented the hybrid blended learning approach for students to receive some in-class instruction as well as online throughout the week. For many schools, a shift system is in place to ensure that all students have some form of in-class sessions. Due to the number of students enrolled at the Elmo Stout High School, selected groups from grades seven through nine are attending classes on campus, while the majority of students in those grades remain in online classes. The infrastructural works have been ongoing at the Brigado Flax Educational Center. As a result of the construction, the number of students on the high school campus secondary division have been limited to the technical students, special education students, and marginalized groups. For the Ivan Dawson Primary School, infrastructural works and campus cleanup have begun. In the meantime, in order to ensure that students have some classroom instructional time, since the 11th of January 2021, the school is occupying the King Garden Bay Baptist Church Hall for classes. I thank Dr. Melvin Tomble, Dr. Michael Tomble, and the district representative, Honorable Mitch Tomble, for helping to facilitate this. Further maintenance works at the Leonora Delville Primary School have started and some projects are now completed at Alexandrina Maduro Primary School, Ebenezer Thomas Primary School, Francis Letson Primary School, and Robinson O'Neill Memorial Primary School. Mr. Speaker, I'm well aware of the challenges that parents, teachers, and students have in coping with the impact of COVID-19. I celebrate our resilience, and I can say that without a shadow of a doubt, we are turning a corner in our fight against COVID-19. It has not been an easy time for teachers, students, and parents, and employers, but we are grateful to God that we are poised to make improvements now due to our commendable management of COVID-19. I will be requesting through cabinet very shortly that consideration be given for a reduction in the social distancing in classrooms from six feet to three feet. This reduction will allow for more classrooms to accommodate more students, eliminating in most instances the double sessions for teachers. Mr. Speaker, we are seeking ways to address the challenges that our children and education system are facing, while ensuring we remain vigilant in keeping our children safe. Mr. Speaker, I have engaged the Ministry of Health on what would be required to for further normalize our education system. And their refrain has been consistent the vaccination of the population is the means by which our travel, our churches, our entertainment, our businesses, and yes, our education system can return to normalcy. Therefore, I engage the Ministry of Health to make vaccinations of teachers and parents a priority. Mr. Speaker, Recent information posted indicates that as of the 3rd of March, there were 4,450 persons that have received COVID-19 vaccinations. And I'm sure it's much more after yesterday. And I'm pleased to inform this honorable house that several educators have taken the first dose of the vaccine. And many more will be ready for shots when the second batch arrives in about two weeks. Mr. Speaker, as an example to those in the education system, I too have taken the vaccine and lived to tell the tale. Mr. Speaker, I pulled the guns out and in a matter of seconds, it was all over. I congratulate the Ministry of Health 
for the awesome job they are doing with the vaccine rollout. And Mr. Speaker, we like to complain, but the Ministry of Health has been pushing forward despite some of the complaints and they're rolling and persons are being vaccinated and we should all show them our appreciation. Mr. Speaker, there's some fear that the vaccine will be forced on teachers and parents. I wish to assure the public that the vaccinations remain voluntary. I understand the concerns of those who are hesitant to take the vaccine. To help allay the concerns of those who are skeptical, we have arranged with our health professionals to have special sessions for our educators. Some schools have held discussion sessions with staff on the vaccine. And by the end of this week, we would have confirmed sessions for the other schools. We thank Dr. Ronald Georges and members of his medical team who have been making the presentations and engaging discussions about the vaccine. I'm also aware that other doctors in the private sector and elsewhere have been helping to spread the message. The struggle for adequate internet coverage in schools continues, Mr. Speaker. But I am pleased to say that some progress was made over the last months in the build out of the internet infrastructure that should address the coverage on campus. During the course of this term, the mounting of Promethean boards in schools was completed. This will help with the delivery of the lessons, accommodating students in class as well as those online. Partnering with the Department of Information Systems, plans are on stream to further equip schools to improve internet coverage on campus. Mr. Speaker, we have had significant improvements with the number of students having devices to use. Where possible, we saw a number of parents purchasing or loaning devices for the students. We received the laptops that were purchased through the government stimulus package, which, is close, which were close to 500. And these were made available for the students to use through the loan program. We have also received a further 855 laptops through a loan from the Caribbean Development Bank. Also over the last term, many students were gifted with hundreds of devices by private businesses or nonprofit organizations. I must say, Mr. Speaker, that the public-private partnership has been extremely good, and I take the opportunity to thank our private businesses and organizations for the tangible contributions to education. For the staff, training will continue. Professional development sessions engage the staff in workshops by subject and grade. Also, we have engaged support staff in areas that will improve the delivery of the services they offer that impact the daily administration of education. This week, March 7th through the 13th, we will be observing Education Week under the theme, Educating All in Changing Times. We have a great lineup of activities that started on Sunday afternoon, the 7th of March, with the opening ceremony at the Eileen L. Parsons Auditorium. Students from various schools participated in the program, and I gave remarks and declared the week open. There are several highlights happening throughout the week, including the secondary schools debate finals taking place today. It actually started uh, before I came here to the House of Assembly today with the Claudia Crickey Educational Center and the Brigado Flax Educational Center, both schools from the 9th District. Debating the moot, virtual learning has caused more problems for the Virgin Islands than it has solved. And later this evening, there will be the annual Early Childhood Book Parade on Facebook. The inter-primary sports will be held at the A.O. Shirley Recreation Grounds on the Friday and Saturday evening. On Friday and on Saturday evening, a special event is being planned for educators. 
There will be a daily media presentation by selected students celebrating teachers. I extend an invitation to the members of this honorable house to support the ministry in all its activities. During the week, there will also be a special feature of the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament with the first sitting of their first session on Thursday the 12th of March at 5 p.m. at the Save the Seed Energy Center. The Youth Parliament will be debating the moot should the BVI move towards self-determination. Mr. Speaker, I express thanks to the Chief Education Officer and her staff at the Ministry, principals and staff in all schools, the maintenance team and parents for their non-stop commitment and hard work. We continue to strive to offer the students the best educa educational opportunities given the constraints of COVID-19. We endeavor to in educate all in these changing times. I ask for the continued cooperation and patience of all as we walk through the anomalies presented daily as a result of the worldwide, worldwide prevalence of the pandemic. And before I close, I would like to announce the establishment of the Education Advisory Board, which is chaired and co-chaired by Mr. Stacy Mather and Mr. Kiran Tadman. They will be advising me on all things education. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the Deputy Premier for his contribution, for his statement. I recognize the Minister for Mr. Speaker, I have one more statement. Oh, my humble apologies, sir. Proceed. Mr. Speaker, good day and God's blessings to the people of the Virgin Islands. In April 2020, I stood in this honorable house and informed the people of these Virgin Islands about the economic stimulus for fishers and farmers in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that Cabinet site fit to approve the stimulus, and I would like to take this time to thank our honorable Premier and his team for administering the stimulus to fishers and farmers across the territory. Mr. Speaker, I have spoken several times about the need to be intentional in our efforts to build our agricultural and fisheries industries, and we continue to make every effort to do so. Progress has been slow in some aspects, Mr. Speaker, but we continue to persevere. In January, we held a meeting with our fishers and farmers, and a combined total of over 200 fishers and farmers were in attendance. Mr. Speaker, it was truly heartening to see our people turn out in these numbers and express such passion and commitment to these sectors. Many persons have returned to the ground, and there's a vibrant community of backyard gardeners across the territory. People are searching for land to undertake farming on a larger scale, and there's a renewed interest in our fishing industry, especially among younger persons. Mr. Speaker, we have to harness this momentum and provide solid and sustained support for these sectors. Mr. Speaker, you have heard me speak about our intention to establish a statutory body to focus solely on the business and regulation of the agriculture and fishing industries. To this end, Mr. Speaker, we spent most of 2020 in consultation with various groups concerning the establishment of this body. An initial draft of the Agriculture and Fisheries Market and Authority Bill was prepared and approved by Cabinet to undergo final drafting by the Attorney General's Chambers. Once the final draft is complete, it will be taken to Cabinet for final approval before it is laid in the House of Assembly. I encourage everyone to familiarize themselves with this bill and weigh in as much as possible. I have had persons involved in fishing and farming visit me to discuss various aspects of the bill, and I welcome this type of open dialogue. The only way forward is together. Mr. Speaker, this authority will be responsible for the reestablishment of what was once the BVI fishing complex. The intention is to repurpose the, this complex to include agricultural produce and other value-added goods from local farmers and fishers. Mr. Speaker, we are excited about this vision 
and see this as a necessary step to support our fishing and farming community and other industries connected to these sectors, such as tourism. Fisheries, Mr. Speaker, is a priority in the territory's blue economy, and we recognize the importance of this sector's sustainability. The Department of Agriculture and Fisheries has received support in collaboration with regional and international bodies to strengthen the department's capacity for data capture, research, and monitoring. Our Virgin Gorda substation, Mr. Speaker, has been out of commission for some time. Agriculture and fishery staff on Virgin Gorda have been without office accommodation since the passage of Hurricanes Orma and Maria. I am therefore pleased to share that a custom-built office trailer is on the island, and we expect to provide services to our fishers and farmers in Virgin Gorda from that new location within the coming months. Mr. Speaker, farmers continue to face frustrating water woes on the Parakita Bay estate. Leaking pipes and indiscriminate water use when it is available are some major issues we are facing in this area. With the assistance of my honorable colleague and his team at the Ministry of Transportation, Works and Utilities, we are working on upgrading the aging infrastructure on the estate. Major works will include carrying out comprehensive repairs to the water distribution system and installing hillside tanks that can supply water on the estate when the main supply is unavailable. Other major works in Parakeeta Bay include the reconstruction of the animal pound to alleviate some issues we face with free roaming animals and the damage they can cause to properties throughout the territory. And that is nearly finished. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I am also pleased to inform this Honorable House that plans are afoot to host a farmers and fishers exhibition and market day on the 24th of April 2021 under the theme Restore, Increase, Sustain, and Educate, uh, which those words make the acro acronym RISE. RISE. Restore, Increase, Sustain, and Educate. Mr. Speaker, we will all appreciate that resources are very limited, and we are very mindful that precautions to reduce the risk of the spread of COVID-19 are still very much in place. We do, however, think that it is important to highlight the work of the agriculture and fishery sectors and look forward to everyone's support and participation as much as possible. Mr. Speaker, I will also be announcing plans for Fisherman's Day very soon. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to update this Honorable House and look forward to providing further updates as we continue in our efforts to empower these sectors. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the Deputy Premier for his statements. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to provide this Honorable House with an update on the Ministry of Transportation, Works and Utilities, the Ralph T. O'Neill Administration Complex. Firstly, allow me please to update on the progress of the works for the R.T. O'Neill Administration Complex. This project is not only an important project for the government of the Virgin Islands, but also for the entire Virgin Islands community. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation, Works and Utilities has developed a comprehensive approach to the renovation of the administration complex. In brief, it is a four-pronged approach and as follows. Demolition and removal of existing building components, ensuring the complex is watertight and resilient against the high winds and undertake repairs to the building cladding, design and installation of new mechanical, electrical, plumbing and ICT systems, and four, interior outfitting and configuration. Mr. Speaker, the demolition works, as mentioned, includes the removal of all damaged components, such as existing walls, flooring, and other elements to ensure a clean area throughout. The demolition works also include the removal of all mold ridden items and to undertake mold remediation once the spaces are fully cleared. 
Mr. Speaker, today, we have demolished the majority of office spaces in the West Atrium to include removing of our flooring, walls, ceiling, and other items. In addition, we have relocated the majority of fires located on the West Atrium to a secure location to be managed by the Archives and Record Management Unit under the Deputy Governor's Office. The demolition works are currently on hold until the Treasury Department and the Inland Revenue Department are relocated to their temporary Fishbill location. Following the relocation, we will recommence the demolition works, particularly on the East Atrium and the basement. Mr. Speaker, ensuring the administration complex is watertight is of the greatest importance as it ensures that water is not entering the complex and impacting the quality of the air within the office spaces. To this end, my ministry has completed the full installation of the waterproofing membrane to the administration complex roof through the company professional roofing. In addition, my ministry has completed the full installation of skylights replacement to the company Wallen Glass. At present, my ministry has currently contracted Design BVI Limited to undertake the replacement of all the exterior glass windows and doors. Once Design BVI Limited has completed this component of the project, we will see a significant transformation to the exterior of the building. Mr. Speaker, my ministry through the procurement unit of the Ministry of Finance has recently released a tender document for the construction of a new basement parking access on the West Atrium. Drainage enhancement to the East and West Atrium and replacement of exterior metal doors on the East Atrium maintenance entrances. This tender will go towards increased drainage within the compound, water infiltration prevention, and enhancing the services of the administration complex. Mr. Speaker, the original designs of the administration complex actually incorporated two basement parking areas, one on the East Atrium and one on the West Atrium. The spaces were assigned and built for the two basement parking areas, but the access road to the basement parking on the West Atrium was never constructed. Mr. Speaker, as the basement parking on the West Atrium is still available, we will construct the access road to allow what was originally envisioned by the designers to be fully put in place. Mr. Speaker, my ministry in conjunction with OBM Limited is finalizing designs to repair the exterior building cladding. A close examination of the administration complex will reveal numerous gashes and substantial damage to the building cladding throughout. The administration complex is clad with an external insulation finishing system, EIFS stucco. This EIFS stucco is quite complicated as it includes a foam board layer and a fiberglass mesh layer in addition to the finished stucco. The design team is working with the product distributor to identify the best solution. It is expected that a tender will be issued by the second quarter of this year for the repair and installation of the stucco. The current focus on my ministry along with OBMI is to finalize the exterior works to ensure the building is fully watertight and resilient before engaging the, ex the interior components of the work towards. Not Notwithstanding preliminary designs are ongoing towards the development of the MEP designs system and the ICT system, as well as the interior office design. Mr. Speaker, I move the road works. I will update, Mr. Speaker, this honorable house and the residents of the BVI on the progress to date on our road work projects funded through CDB, Caribbean Development Bank, Rehabilitation and Construction Loan Facility. 
Since January 2021, the construction teams continued work at all the major project sites and significant progress has been made over the first two months of this year. My teams at the Ministry and the Recovery and Development Agency, along with the various contractors, are working tirelessly to complete these projects as quickly as possible without compromising quality and public safety. Mr. Speaker, currently works are being carried out on four major road roadways in the BVI. The Ridge Road from Hope Hill to Little Dix Road, Fort Hill above Bob Gas Station, Great Mountain Road, and Ballast Bay. Works in all areas essentially require the erection of retaining walls where the road has been undermined and erecting safety barriers where needed. Improving the, the drainage designs including the installation of bridge culverts at Great Mountain and Ballast Bay will increase drainage capacity, thereby precluding any future flood-related damages and road rehabilitation. Overall, I am pleased to report that the, progress, the projects are progressing steadily, requiring some necessary road closures and traffic disruption, which have inconvenienced residents and motorists as you have been required to use alternate routes, especially at Great Mountain and Ballast Bay. I thank you for your continued patience and cooperation. As you can appreciate, these are major and essential road projects, and all actions taken were crucial to facilitate uninterrupted works and to ensure your safety and that of the construction crews. I have regular conversation with the contractors and the RDA team to get frequent updates on progress and any delays which we always endeavor to communicate to you on a timely basis. I will now provide you with a detailed update on, those, on these ongoing road infrastructure projects. Great Mountain Site 1. This is a project closest to the top of Great Mountain. Mr. So Speaker, this project was completed on the 27th of January, 2021. The only work remaining on this site is the asphalting, which will be completed as part of the wider asphalting program that will commence in the upcoming months. Works at Great Mountain Site 2, that is the project closest to Huntum's Gut. This, these works has progressed well. The full road closure of the Great Mountain Road permitted concentrated works to occur and has allowed the construction of the new culvert structure on that site. The road reopened on the 22nd February, but there is still a requirement for full closures for, as the works is completed, as the work is completed. I assure you, you will be notified of the dates and times in the upcoming weeks. Works at Hope Hill are nearing completion. The drainage component of the project is almost complete, as well as the installation of safety barriers on all sites. Finishing touches will be made to the barriers within the next two weeks. Little Dix Hill saw the completion of the most technical component of the works during the second week of January with concrete placement completed to the retaining wall. Works are ongoing to the other smaller retaining structures, and this is expected to be completed shortly. Backfilling to the retaining structure and road resurfacing works can then commence. Works at the Bob Gas Station continue with the ex excavation for the drainage. This project is proceeding according to schedule, proceeding according to schedule, and the, wor the road will remain open for one-lane traffic during peak hours. At Ballast Bay, the demolition of the existing culvert and construction of the new culvert is underway. Therefore, full road closure will be required until early April as the new bridge and culvert structure is completed. This is a bit longer than initially envisioned but the project is complex and thus time-consuming. 
but we will keep the residents abreast of the new timelines as the project progresses to completion. I have received numerous complaints, Mr. Speaker, about the condition of the Fish Bay Road. The Public Works Department has done some temporary overlay work to improve the road surface. But I would like to assure you that fixing this roadway is a priority of my government and is part of the CDB-funded road projects. Given that the BVI road network is not expensive, we have to take a phased approach to road rehabilitation to ensure that alternate routes remain available as other roads are fixed. Following the completion of the works at Little Dix Hill and Hope Hill, we will commence the procurement process for Fish Bay Road. Additionally, repairs to the section of Long Trench Road, damage following the passage of Hurricane Irma, will begin following the completion of the Bob Gas Station Road project. I would like to remind the public that slope stabilization and road rehabilitation works are currently being executed in the territory and are detailed and are complex in nature. It is critical that we have properly engineered road infrastructure that will withstand the forces of mother nature and constant use. Considerably planning and precision have been employed for this project and the BVI will benefit from a more resilient road network. I would like to thank the people of this territory for their patience and understanding as road rehabilitation works take place throughout the territory. I implore you to traverse these areas cautiously and follow the directions of designated traffic wardens. I would also like to make a special appeal to the scooter and motorbike riders. The roads are closed for the safety of the community and you must obey all signs and instruction of the traffic wardens. By disobeying them, you are putting yourself and others at serious risk of injury and God forbid anything worse. As a further reminder to motorists, please stay informed. Traffic advisory notices are disseminated through various media outlets and social media, in particular the government and the RDA's Facebook and Instagram pages and websites. So is Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my ministry has been working assiduously on recommencing this long outstanding and critical project for the Eastern Long Loop residents. We are well on the way with the preparation of the staging area which is located in Parakeeta Bay. The staging area is critical to the project as it, as it will be the area where the material is stored for implementation. Fill material is stockpiled and excavated material is sifted for reuse. Due to the way in which material was previously deposited at at the site, post armor required substantial effort to assess, sort, and stockpile material for reuse into the sewage project and elsewhere. Mr. Speaker, as a result of our preliminary sorting and inventory control efforts, we were able to identify HDPE pipes required for the installation of force main lines for the Paramtong to Long Swamp sewer installation. This represents a substantial savings to the government of the Virgin Islands by not having to procure those pipes for the project. We will be setting out to fence the staging area, procure containers for storage of fittings and material, and conducting a final inventory of material available at the Parakeeta Bay site. Mr. Speaker, in addition, my ministry has developed designs for a sifting and sorting system of excavated material during the mainline sewage works. This also represents a savings as any unusable excavated material can be reused as fill material after the installation of sewer lines. 
it is expected that the works to install this last segment of the HDPE force main lines will commence at the end of this month. These will be done all by local contractors. Mr. Speaker, Cabinet approved the amendment to the Financial Management Act that stipulated that the Ministry of Finance establishes a contractor registration and classification system database whereby contractors, heavy equipment operators, and other vendors can register for participation in this Eastern and Long Look sewage project. This database will be the main source of which contractors are selected through an evaluation process for works on this project. My ministry and I continue to impress upon contractors to register to be a part of the various government projects and programs. Mr. Speaker, it is expected that civil works will commence at the end of this month with the installation of approximately 950 linear feet of eight inch force main lines. It is anticipated that this project will last a period of 12 months. Water situation, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to address our most critical resource to livelihood, water. Water infrastructure in the territory has been under stress for decades. The infrastructure is aged and dilapidated, and as a result, frequent repairs of leaks and water line breakage have become the modus operandi of the Water and Sewage Department on a daily basis. Water distribution is further complicated by the topography of the territory, of course, with the exception of Anigata, who suffers with other water quality issues. The mountainous terrain on the remaining islands make pressure management challenging. We cannot continue to have residents living without a reliable, potable water supply. For this reason, with the support of the ministry, the Water and Sewage Department has placed much emphasis on improving and enhancing the water distribution networks. The plan for an island with our topography is to reduce the pressures with pressure reducing valves, leak detection exercises, leak repairs with resilient material, installation of air re release valves, and meteorization. Thus far, water distribution improvement can be realized in Seacows Bay and surrounding communities. This was made possible with a water optimization project, which included a leak detection exercise, water line repairs, the installation of a pressure reducing station to reduce the reoccurrence of leaks, and the installation of pumps to enable water to reach homes at higher elevation in the area. Mr. Speaker, other communities have benefited from this leak detection and repair program, and the department is now able to supply water to more residents at better pressures and distribution consistency. Our next focus is to address, address the water situation in the Chalwell and Kinganme areas. Though they are receiving water, it is not yet reliable, and some places only receive water once or twice a week. This, Mr. Speaker, is something we want to remedy in the upcoming months because this is not acceptable. Additionally, the Reservoir Restoration Project, which commenced in 2018 in the aftermath of the hurricanes, is now approaching the end. The Carrot Bay and Long, Bay Re the Carrot Bay and Long Bush Reservoir Restoration Works are well underway. Upon completion of the Carrot Bay Reservoir, the Zion Hill Restoration Works will commence. Mr. Speaker, while the Water and Sewage Department collects an average of $5 million per annum in revenues for sale of potable water, it pays the water suppliers approximately $27 million per annum, which results in a gross variance of some $22 million each year. Let me say that again, Mr. Speaker. 
Water and Sewage Department collects an average of $5 million per annum in revenues from sale of potable water. It pays the water suppliers approximately $27 million per annum, which results in a gross variance of some $22 million each year. When calculated, this equates to the Water and Sewage Department recouping a mere 14% of its operating expenditure when compared to the current losses in excess of 80% in revenues. Mr. Speaker, in an effort to curb the margin of loss, in the first instance, 5,325 ultrasonic digital water meters with the cap capability to read remotely were purchased and are being installed throughout the territory, thereby replacing the existing analog meters. This will lead to a more efficient and effective water accountability and billing system. Mr. Speaker, over the past few months, the ministry and the department have been bombarded with calls from customers who have been experiencing a myriad of water issues pertaining to, but not limited to, their water bill. This and other issues are of real concern to me and my ministry, and we are working feverishly to solve them. In an effort to effectively and efficiently address all customer concerns in a timely manner, the department has optimized its customer service team that will focus on receiving queries, investigating situations, and providing options to remedy these situations. In recognizing the heightened challenges the customers are experiencing, the government of the Virgin Islands has placed a three-month grace period on water disconnection territory-wide. This grace period took effect on January 18 and is slated to expire at the end of April, April 30th. This period is to allow customers the opportunity to settle outstanding balances. This government understands the challenges that the residents have experienced as a result of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result, we decided to add some leniency in the regularly scheduled disconnections. During this period, continue to encourage customers of the water and sewage, including those with bill discrepancies, to make arrangements to bring your accounts current. The department has been refocused to a customer-oriented establishment. While we saw through these issues one by one, we asked for some patience and a bit of understanding, but rest assured, your issues will be listened to, noted, and addressed in a timely manner. Customers are encouraged to call the ministry and or the department, and they will be directed to the appropriate personnel who would ensure that the matter is addressed. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the member for the 5th District for his statement. At this time, I recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration, and member for the 9th District, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have three short statements. Mr. Speaker, the first one is the BVI Environmental Atlas. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to inform this Honorable House of the publication of the BVA Environmental Atlas. The Atlas was a brainchild of Mr. Bertrand Letsom, and its development began in 2002 through an initial grant from the UK Overseas Territories Environment Program, OTEP, o -T -E -P. The National Park Trust of the Virgin Islands collaborated with 39 local, regional, and international experts to create this very valuable resource. The National Park Trust of the Virgin Islands received a second injection of funding from the governor's office in 2020 in order to get a publication done. Mr. Speaker, after a long hiatus, 
we are happy to announce that the Atlas is available. Up to this point, the teaching of geography and the environment in BVI schools has relied upon the use of regional and international atlases. We now have our own and can share with the world our unique features. Mr. Speaker, this new environment atlas is anticipated to become a critical resource for teachers and students throughout the territory. And we will be distributing the first copies to our schools very shortly. The National Park Trust is working on getting copies available for sale to the general public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, update on the stony coral tissue loss disease. Mr. Speaker, thank you for allowing me to give an update on a stony coral tissue loss disease, SCTLD. In a previous statement, Mr. Speaker, I outlined that our coral reefs were being attacked by this disease, which if not controlled, would be disastrous for our reefs, which are critical for our environment. The reefs are home to our sea life. They offer protection to our coastlines during hurricanes and high waves. They are a source of sand for beaches. They are home to many of the potfish that locals eat. And they are an important element of our tourism product. The National Parks Trust, in collaboration with the Ministry of Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, Unite BVI, the Governor's Office, and the local dive operators have been tackling SCTLD. Efforts will continue until the end of March 2021. Aggressive treatment of SCTLD for some areas has allowed a slow or partial recovery of some affected species. Unfortunately, some species are more susceptible than others. As a result, some corals have died. In addition to the aggressive treatment of affected corals, Several cartoon scripts have been developed and released as part of the education component of this project. Mr. Speaker, I, I would implore all boaters, tourists, and locals alike not to empty their holding tanks within 1,000 meters from the shoreline, as SCLTD is caused by unidentified bacteria. We look forward to the assistance of all, Mr. Speaker, and this is an extremely important aspect of our environment and our livelihood. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I now move on to the extension of the layoff period here in the BVI. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity again to address this honorable house and the people of this territory. Today, I want to give an update on the layoff period and severance pay matters for employers and employees of businesses in these islands. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, my ministry, the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, and the Immigration Department has, have continuously banded together to make the necessary adjustments needed to accommodate legal work in this territory during the pandemic. We have made many adjustments to procedures, policies, and even legislation to accommodate the varying needs of our people. Mr. Speaker, the issue of layoffs and payment of severance is one that is burdensome to say the least. As we straddle the thin line of economic sustainability and humane practices for workers. I want the public to know that we are cognizant of all possibilities surrounding the payment of severance. Mr. Speaker, as you will, would recall in June 2020, I introduced the Labor Code Amendment Act 2020, which allowed for the layoff period to be changed from its usual three months and announced an extended period from March through 31st October 2020. That amendment suspended the payment of severance pay due to an employee during that period, thus allowing businesses to get their bearing as the pandemic had just hit our shores. Once this period had ended, and we realized the effects of COVID-19 were still very real and fluid, 
we again sought to bring aid to employees and employers. In November 2021, I came before you, Mr. Speaker, again to bring forward the Labor Code Extension of Severance Pay Period Order 2020, which allowed for a further extension to 31st January 2021, giving employees and employers a further three months. Thereafter, the final extension was given in February of this year to cover the period up to 28 February 2021. Mr. Speaker, we have done all that we can to make the necessary adjustments to allow for employers to be properly prepared to make the relevant payment in a timely manner to their employees. Mr. Speaker, as the government continues to push forward with initiatives that will aid in bringing persons to our shores to revive economic activities, we are cognizant of the climate that persons that persists where work is scarce. However, Mr. Speaker, employees are the most important asset of a business and compensation should be delayed no further. Mr. Speaker, I ask here today that employers make the necessary arrangements with employees to bring outstanding payments current. Those who may be unable to honor their full obligation to employees are required to visit the Department of Labor and Workforce Development to gain assistance in developing plans to make these outstanding payments and make them in line with a mutually agreed plan for their employees. The Department of Labor and Workforce Development is ready and available to assist those who are unsure of the way forward and those needing guidance with closing these outstanding matters. Persons needing assistance can visit the Department of Labor and Workforce Development in person or contact a labor relations officer at 468-4739 and 468-4713. The speaker, I'll repeat those numbers for persons who didn't have a pen and paper handy. Persons needing assistance can visit the Department of Labor and Workforce Development in person or contact a labor relations officer at 468-4739 and 468-4713. Or you can also send emails to labor, L-A-B-O-U-R, at G-O-V dot V-G. Mr. Speaker, these are not easy times. But I implore persons to remain considerate of their employees and employers. Remain honest in their dealings, especially as it relates to old severance. Remain sympathetic to the many situations created. Remain thankful for all opportunities and to remain safe during this time. Mr. Speaker, may God continue to bless these beautiful Virgin Islands as we navigate this pandemic. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the Ninth District for his statement. At this time, I recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Carvin Malone. Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to make these two um, statements. I would not qualify them as to being short or, or long. But Mr. Speaker, um, there were some developments which I was having in terms of um, probably requiring, I, I was hoping that, that they would have bumped our way to lunch, but uh, no such luck. So um, here we are. I would do my best to make sure that I cover the details that are necessary in order for us to uh, move this forward. Mr. Speaker, the first is on the relaunch of the Healthy School Program. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that the Ministry of Health and Social Development 
is aware of the primary requirement for a wealthy society is the, is the attaining of a healthy society. In this regard, the ministry is committed to a functioning and funded health and wellness council. The Non-Communicable Disease Subcommittee will be resolute in accomplishing, in the accomplishment of their charter. The unit will work with the Ministry of Labor in developing healthy workplaces. They will partner with the Ministry of Transport in developing healthy spaces and places. The Complete Health Improvement Program by the Social Development Department is now in its second cohort. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education and I were pleased to be a part of the Healthy School Program relaunch, which, as you are aware, was affected by the passage of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. The Healthy School Program is one of the interventions of the Non-Communicable Disease Prevention and Control Program. Inadequate physical activity and unhealthy eating are two behavioral risk factors. These will contribute to chronic disease, which is identified as a significant health problem in the territory. This program is a joint venture of the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture, and the Ministry of Health and Social Development. Since this program is a school-based intervention, the Ministry of Education has taken the primary role. Mr. Speaker, Public Health Research has long established the vital role of nutrition and physical activity as two essential aspects of a good school health program. We know that a healthy diet, including vegetables and fruits, can help prevent ob obesity and some chronic diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and some cancers. There is mountain evidence that also shows that age-appropriate, regular physical activity contributes to children's health and well-being. Good nutrition and physical activity contribute to the health of children, but there is also strong evidence that they contribute to the support of children's academic performance. According to research from the Center of, for Disease Control in the United States, physical activities contribute to students' cognitive skills, attitudes, and activities contribute to students' cognitive skills, attitude, and academic performance. The impact is also seen in children enhanced concentration, attention, and schoolroom behavior. Hence, I stress the importance of this initiative since it can help to improve our children's health, which is also important with the threat of COVID-19 as well. So I encourage principals, parents, and teachers to work together to keep our students healthy. I want to acknowledge the technical and financial support, Mr. Speaker, that we have received to continue this program. I also want to thank the Caribbean Public Health Agency for providing technical and financial support in getting this program started. The United Kingdom Public Health Agency for providing 20 scales for participating schools. I say a huge thank you to the BVI Olympic Committee for its outstanding contributions to promoting physical activity in the territory and this school program. Through the BVI Olympic Committee, we were able to form an alliance with Sport for Life Canada, the leading international agency in promoting physical literacy. Sport for Life Canada provided technical support for the physical literacy component of the Healthy 
program. The BVI Olympic Committee also obtained a grant from Olympic Solidarity to purchase essential physical exercise equipment for primary schools and 10 <coughs> preschools. They printed educational material and conducted a communication campaign to promote physical literacy and how the benefits in school. I want to thank Ms. Petrona Davis from the Secretary, Ministry of Health and Social Development, who provided funding to replace the educational material for the program that was destroyed by Hurricane Irma. In addition, the Department of the Secretary also provided funding to support Sports for Life Canada Consultancy. Long-term sustainability is often the main reason why many programs fail, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, to ensure ongoing support for this necessary intervention, my ministry is finalizing a memorandum of understanding with the BVI Olympic Committee to continue its collaboration to the development of physical literacy in school and at the community level. The ministry will continue to support collaboration on various levels and is finalizing and updated MOU between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health to strengthen school health education. Ms. Patrice Maduro, the public health nutritionist in the public health unit, serves as the Ministry of Health new liaison officer to support this program. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank Dr. Irat Potter, the Chief Medical Officer, Ms. Marcia Potter, for the unswerving effort to ensure the program was implemented. We cannot go but give specific thanks and gratitude to all those persons who have worked tirelessly in making sure that this program once initiated from, from ways back in 20, two, 2008, Mr. Speaker, and coming up through to today, Ms. Ivy George has been instrumental, critical, important in terms of getting this program to where it is, though hampered by the storms of 2017. Special thanks to the senior staff in the Ministry of Education and the health liaison teachers at the community level for their cooperation and collaboration in making the Healthy School Program a reality and a priority. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the first statement. I, I was hoping I can beg your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, for issuing the last statement, only because it has implications um, as to the vaccine rollout and I wanted to make sure that I give the staff in that the emerging data that is being incorporated in the statement, and I would love to give them the next 30 minutes. I, I, I pushed them as hard as I could, but they would love to be able to get a little more time to get the statement out, because um, as the scientific data becomes available, we want to make sure that we get the proper information out. See if I may. You may. Thank you. So after lunch? Yes, we will. Thank allow, you, much. Yeah. We will allow you to do the other statement, perhaps after the questions, yes. or even immediately before. OK, honorable members, I thank all members for the statement. And in keeping with the standing orders, I trust that members have their statement ready to distribute to the House. Is it your wish that we take a break now for lunch or we proceed to the next item? That's a yes for break. Okay. This house will now stand in recess until 2.30. House is in recess.
testing. This Honorable House now resumes its sitting. We left off with a request by the Health Minister that he had one more statement. So I now invite the Minister for Health and Social Development with his final statement. Speaker, for again, afford me the opportunity to make the second statement which we have, and it indeed is the update on the vaccination um, and the advocacy program. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19, as you are aware, was declared a global pandemic on March 11, 2020. Empowered by the Public Health Ordinance of 1977, the Infectious Disease Notification Act of 2013, the Quarantine Act 2014, and the Public Health COVID-19 Control and Suppression Measures Orders of 2020, the Health Emergency Operations Center, HEOC, was activated as a primary advisory body in the territory's defense, defense against COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, with the advice, decisions, and actions of the HEOC, the Cabinet of the Virgin Islands, the House of Assembly, and the efficient works of public, private, and voluntary institutions and individuals, as a territory, we were able to enact nine public health COVID-19 control suppression measure supplement of COVID of 45 curfew orders, redesigned and commissioned a COVID-19 isolation ward on the third floor of the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital. The facilities and ensured the certification of laboratory services for on-site COVID-19 testing in the territory and to date have conducted 24,597 tests, which is more, um, of which 154 were positive. 152 have recovered, one untimely death, and there exists presently one active case resulting from a returning resident who was tested while in quarantine. We developed and commissioned COVID-19 permanent and mobile swabbing facilities at the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital at the TB Letcham International Airport at various interim locations throughout the Virgin Islands. We approved and funded quarantine accommodations, transportation and meals free of cost to qualified individuals from June 1st, 2020 to February 28th, 2021. And we proactively contracted with COVAX, with the COVAX consortium for the provision of vaccines when they became or becomes available. Notification of the units have been received and the receipt has been analyzed. Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that with the Attorney General, we are seeking to get the indemnity clause, the insurance clause, and all of the other legal requirements for this to be finalized. So too would we have to include the 2,000 doses that we received from Dominica as a, as a gift that they received from India and the manufacturers there so that we can have them approved for usage here in the Virgin Islands. So one need not worry, one need not fear. We would have all of the dots crossed and the T's made so that we can have safe delivery of any vaccines received in this country, whether from India, whether from Belgium, whether from the UK, or any other source. Mr. Speaker, on February 4th, 2021, the Virgin Islands received the first 8,000 doses of vaccine, complements of the United Kingdom government. Members of this honorable house will be aware that five members of this house, inclusive of the Minister of Health Development, that's me, Governor Rankin, and you, Mr. Speaker, 
were among the 33 brave persons vaccinated on February 11, 2021. Further to this, Mr. Speaker, we began the rollout of the vaccination campaign in a phased manner, starting with health care and frontline workers in phase one, followed by elderly and those with chronic diseases in phase two. During the week of the February 15th, this was accomplished. During the week of February 21st, Mr. Speaker, phase three, which included essential workers, commenced. Admittedly, the planned rollout of the vaccination program did not materialize exactly as we had envisaged. However, we continue to progress in this important initiative. The vaccine rollout, Mr. Speaker, was struck using community vaccination centers at the r and r Complex in Port Pond, First Teresa Smith Blyden Clinic, St. Williams Catholic Hall in Rotown, the Eastern Seventh-day Adventist Church in Fat Hogs, in Fat Hogs Bay, and the King Garden Bay Baptist Church on and the North Sun Clinics on Virgin Gorda, and the clinics on Jocelyn Dyke and Anagata. Mr. Speaker, using this community vaccination approach, we have been able to achieve between 500 to 600 vaccinations per day, with the exception of the days that the program was placed on hold due to concerns with the delay of the arrival of the second shipment of AstraZeneca from the United Kingdom and the need to ensure that persons having done their first inoculation would be assured of the availability of the second dose. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform the Honorable House as of today, March 10, 2021, we have completed 5,000 in, and 31 vaccinations in these Virgin Islands. Mr. Speaker, this number accounts for 4,113 individuals on Tortola, 770 on Virgin Gorda, 68 on Anagata, 80 on Justin Dyke. Mr. Speaker, for emphasis, I must note for the record of this Honorable House, a decision was made to place on hold the distribution of vaccinations until we had secured delivery dates for the next two tranches of 12,000 vaccinations each. This pause afforded us the opportunity to consolidate and fine tune the process further. Subsequently, Mr. Speaker, we received from Governor John Rankin excerpts of which I now read as follows. I write to confirm that the United Kingdom now has in its possession adequate quantities of the AstraZeneca vaccine required for the BVI and that the charter flight is being booked for the planned second consignment of vaccines, i.e. 12,000 doses, for delivery to the BVI on the 17th of March, which, if the second doses are to be administered from the 25th of March, allows sufficient time for a further 4,000 people to, be, to have their first dose. Again, please be minded that we have secured enough doses for the entire adult population of the BVI and will continue to work closely with the, with the chief medical officer to ensure BVI has a supply when it needs, with the caveat that this will need to be planned in advance. Mr. Speaker, I further state that provisionally, we have a further 12,000 doses penciled in for the 31st of March. Providing we continue a steady planned approach, I hope you would agree that there is no need to further pause the vaccination program and we should continue together to encourage people to come forward for all that important first dose. I look forward to a continued close working relationship on this very important and time critical program. In actuality, Mr. Speaker, this delay was only for a period of four days, March 3rd through the 8th, 2021. 
The vaccination rollout recommenced on Thursday, on Tuesday, March 9th, and is progressing quite smoothly. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, plans are being finalized with COVAX for the delivery of the 12,000 units of AstraZeneca based on prior mentioned contractual and legal arrangements. Mr. Speaker, when we received the new batches of vaccination, which was originally due on 3rd of March, but now has been confirmed to arrive on the 17th of March, which is next week, we will bring the private sector on board through a memorandum of understanding. The MOU will be executed with qualified private health care providers and require them to provide vaccines at no administrative cost or product cost to persons or the national health insurance program. In recent developments, Mr. Speaker, I have been advised by the acting chief medical officer that on the 6th of March, 2021, an article was published in the, in the Lancet with data from pooled, double-blinded, randomized controlled studies in which 17,178 participants received the AstraZeneca vaccine were modeled. The study, and this is very important to note, the study determined that vaccine efficacy was 81.3% after two standard doses were given 12 weeks apart versus 51.1% when given after two standard doses six weeks apart, and that the difference was statistically significant. I will repeat that because it will have determination for when the second dose will arise. The study determined that vaccine efficacy was 81.3% after two standard doses were given on the 12 weeks apart versus 55.1% when given after two standard doses six weeks apart only. And this difference is statistically significant. This was based on studies recently published, i.e. the 6th of March, 2021. These studies were supported by additional studies done in participants under 55 years of age. It does not exclude those over 55, which showed that more than double the level of antibody response in persons who had the doses in intervals of 12 weeks versus those who had an interval of less than six weeks. The differences, again, were statistically significant, Mr. Speaker. Given that the 12-week intervals is clearly superior, Mr. Speaker, this is the preferred dosing interval advisable by the medical experts and the chief medical officer in the Ministry of Health and Social Development. This guidance takes into account a very clear and published two-fold improvement in the antibody response and 26.2 greater efficacy with the 12-week dose intervals that over the six-week regime. On this premise, Mr. Speaker, persons who would have been scheduled for the second vaccination in the previous 12 weeks intervals will now be rescheduled for administration of the second dose in a 12-week interval. So, Mr. Speaker, to, take this even, to make this even clearer, more clear, I will use my example. My vaccination, as did yours, took place on February 11, 2021. Our second dose in a 12-week regime now falls on May 5, 2021, as opposed to our March 25th date scheduled previously. Persons affected can expect to be contacted by the Health Services Authority with a new appointment date. So anyone who have their vaccination taken and 
there's only a six weeks interval can be expected to be contacted to have it reassigned in a 12 week interval period. Very important, Mr. Speaker. From a legal and ethical standpoint, Mr. Speaker, it is a hope that persons will follow this new regime. And if they are being advised otherwise, or chosen a smaller dosing interval, should do so with full information of the disadvantages. It's not that it cannot be done, but it is not the most efficient. Mr. Speaker, with respect to delivery of vaccines, as many persons as possible should receive their first dose and as quickly as possible. The first dose of vaccines affords very high efficacy against COVID-19 in the order of 76% in the short term against symptomatic COVID-19 and 63.9% when, introdu when introducing both asymptomatic and symptomatic COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, I'll repeat that with, re with respect to delivery of vaccines, as many persons as possible should receive their first dose and as quickly as possible. The first dose of vaccine affords very high efficacy against COVID of in, in the order of 76% in the short term against symptomatic COVID and 63.9% when including both asymptomatic and symptomatic COVID. We are also aware that the first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine reduces infectiousness by as much as 67% and has also led to dramatic reductions of hospitalization in the United Kingdom of over 80% and is high in with just under 20 million persons out of an approximate 60 million population having been vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, it is therefore exceedingly important for as many persons as possible to be vaccinated as quickly as possible so that the territory can, can can move and reap the benefits of vaccination. We are aware of the concept of herd immunity, where if we have sufficient persons vaccinated, we will interrupt the ability of COVID to be transmitted through our population. Widespread vaccination within the territory will also allow us to seriously review our current protocols and look at less onerous entry measures. This even as we begin to look and to advance the process of reopening our ocean borders on the 15th of April. The US CDC, Center of Disease Control, has already recommended that persons who are vaccinated do not need to quarantine after potential exposure to the coronavirus and also that vaccinated persons can gather in small settings without masks and other measures. This can only be accomplished if we get the percentage of our population vaccinated properly. While we will continue to be cautious, it is imperative, Mr. Speaker, that as many persons as possible get vaccinated and see this as an important tool for us as a territory to return to some degree of, of normality and productivity. As such, we are encouraging persons from all sectors and all walks of life to protect themselves, protect those around them, and protect the territory and get vaccinated. Vaccination has been proven to be safe and efficacious. I asked them to make sure I pronounce it properly. Very the, eff the efficacy of it is much improved. Vaccination provides clear benefits to individuals, your connections, your community, and the territory. Mr. Speaker, the scientific evidence is mounting, and it shows categorically that vaccination works at both the individual and the population level. 
vaccination, Mr. Speaker, is our most effective weapon against COVID and the most important means of returning our territory to normality and reclaiming our lives and livelihoods from COVID. Mr. Speaker, we are aware that there are many misconceptions and malicious rumors around vaccination. These are malicious and unfounded, Mr. Speaker. We urge persons to seek reputable information based on evidence and from reputable sources and not to be swayed by malicious misinformation. The Ministry of Health and Social Development continues to be advised by the foremost sources of evidence and experts from the United Kingdom, Public Health England, Pan American Health Organization, and the Caribbean Public Health Agency, and the latest and best available evidence. While vaccinations is safe and effective, we must be aware that allergic reactions can occur within the first 15 minutes after vaccination. As such, all vaccination sites have provisions to safely and effectively treat any type of allergic reactions and also to observe persons for the first 15 minute period after vaccination when most, if not all, immediate allergic reactions may occur. Mr. Speaker, I would, like to, I would like at this time to reiterate the importance of vaccination to the territory. And I heard myself all six times and the reopening of the territory and the economy. While we look at what is going on in the world, it is imperative that Virgin Islands also does its part and, takes, and take responsibility to protect itself and the world from COVID. The BVI Health Services Authority and the private providers will be offering the COVID vaccine to the public. At this point, at this time, at this time and point, the ministry has recommended that the first hour of operation of vaccine administration locations shall be reserved for the following groups of persons, following which all other persons are eligible to be vaccinated, i.e. The centers normally open at 10. What we would like to have is that between 10 and 11 on a daily basis for those sites that are opened to have the healthcare and frontline workers remaining, the elderly and those with chronic diseases remaining, the central workers remaining, and any disabled persons to be able to take advantage of that first hour because they are those persons who register and we must get as many online registration as possible and those who will walk in. Persons can register to be vaccinated on a particular day or walk into the vaccination site. However, all persons must fill out registration information and show identification and pre-registered persons must be given preference. We now have the database in place. We now have all of the registries in place. What we want to make sure, Mr. Speaker, is that those persons who are registered, that they will be given an opportunity to have preference over those persons who are just walking in, save for and accept, of course, these members of the House of Assembly, other frontline persons given the first hour. Mr. Speaker, we must be mindful of new strains of coronavirus that continue to emerge principally because of the large number of infections and the increased chance for mutations. This is another reason why vaccination is important and why all persons must get on board with vaccination. Through vaccination, Mr. Speaker, the world has eliminated or severely reduced the impact of many once terrible diseases. These include smallpox, measles, polio, congenial rubella syndrome, tetanus, and a whole slew of childhood and other diseases. Let us work together through vaccination to add COVID to the list of diseases that were eradicated. Mr. Speaker, we must be aware that partial vaccination programs and partial rollouts of vaccine across the world leave persons vulnerable to infections, but also increase the probability of the 
the, of the development of new strains, which can also lead to new vaccinations having to be developed. We do not want this. I therefore urge all of us to get on board and get vaccinated. This is the eighth time, so that we can look forward to a brighter and better Virgin Islands to put COVID behind us. And at this juncture, Mr. Speaker, I would like to again make the twelfth appeal to all citizens, all persons residing in the territory, to register. Register, register, register. You can go on the government page. Um, that will become available to you. But you can also go on the main page, bvi.gov.vg, and get information on registration, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to make this. Um, I, well, I can't even call it a short statement anymore in and, and making the statement, but very important that we do this. So if we walk away with nothing else, those persons who have been scheduled for a six week period have to now be rescheduled and make it a 12 week period from the date of the original vaccination. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister for his statement. I recognize the leader of the opposition on a point of information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the point of information that I wanted to raise, the, the uh, minister just, as he wrapped up, confirmed it. Um, I just wanted to make sure that in terms of clarity for myself and other persons who were vaccinated that um, the extension is from six weeks to, to 12 weeks for persons who were vaccinated. It is from um, the six week to 12 week and I did not deliberately uh, leave out the brave leader of the opposition uh, having been vaccinated on the very same February 11th is now instead of the 25th of March would be on the 6th of May, 12 weeks after. All right, thank you for that clarity, Minister. Thank you all ministers for your statements. I call upon the clerk. 12 weeks, everyone, from the day. 12 weeks. Item number eight, questions and answers to questions. I invite the leader of the opposition and member for the 8th district to pose his questions to the premier and minister of finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, could the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House what was the number balance of all bank accounts and funds owned by the Government of the Virgin Islands as of March 1, 2019? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is important to highlight that the balance in any bank account will fluctuate based on when outstanding expenditures are charged against the account. Just as when dealing with your own personal checking account, the current balance in the bank does not always reflect all expenses that have been incurred or have not yet been cleared for payment against the account. It is a known fact that expenses incurred do not all come in at the same time some trickling weeks, months, or years after the actual expenses were incurred, incurred. To put it another way, if using a debit card, expenses charged on the card today do not always show up immediately on the account until a day or two after the actual expenditure was made. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, the balance of all bank accounts owned by government do not include all the expenses incurred up to any period that may be in question. This has been most evident and noticeable in 2019 when this government took office. Taking all the aforementioned into consideration, Mr. Speaker, the number balance of all bank accounts and funds owned by the government of the Virgin Islands as of March 2019 are all available at Table 1. And Mr. Speaker, um, can you give us the lead up? So. Thank you. Um, 
Premier, if you don't mind, since seeing as it's not an exhaustive list, you don't mind reading out these accounts? Yeah. Well, it is an exhaustive list because it has a lot of columns in it, but I think the total is 180 something million. Yeah, 180. Yeah. But it's a very exhaustive list, so I didn't want to leave out anything at all, so I brought everything for you. Okay, so 188 million, 903 million. Right. 3,464. That's a full seven. total. Full total. So it's breaking down by okay. banks, which bank, which account, which everything. So it's a full, a full breakdown. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Mr. Speaker, could our Premier Minister of Finance please tell us on the House what was the number balance of all bank accounts and funds owned by the government of the Virgin Islands? as of March 1st, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on, March, on 11 March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Needless to say that this remains the same to date. COVID-19 has brought unprecedented financial challenges to all countries and territories worldwide, with the BVI being no exception. Mr. Speaker, we had to dip heavily into our pockets. That, that is, the people of the Virgin Islands had to set up to step up to the plate to do what we have always done for generations, fend for ourselves to navigate the new regular of living and working with COVID-19. The challenge of balancing lives versus livelihood to date is one that all countries in the world are grappling with, and we thank God for his mercies. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, the number balance of all bank accounts and funds owned by the government of the Virgin Islands as of 1st March 2021 is attached at table two, and again, it's a very extensive list. Mr. Speaker, um, in a very exhausted list, but I make sure that all the information the leader of the opposition requested is on it. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, question number three. Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell us, Honorable House? If the members of the Joint Tax Force who have been working extra shift to protect our borders have been paid their additional allowances as promised? A, if the answer is no, why not? B, how much is owed to them? And C, when will this be rectified? Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely glad that the Leader of the Opposition has asked this question. And that's one good thing about democracy that allows for every angle of information to be out to the people. And it's a very timely question, so I really commend the Leader of the Opposition on this. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has placed the Virgin Islands in need of an increased level of security to ensure the safety of our citizens. Thorough supervision of the Virgin Islands border has been vital during this ongoing pandemic. Supervision was important to avoid illegal entry during the statutory curfew order 2020. Additional supervision was necessary to reduce possible carriers of the virus from inducing community spread within the Virgin Islands. The National Security Council, NSC, supported a multi-agency operation identified as a Joint Task Force, JTF, which includes officers from the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, VIPF, Her Majesty's HM Custom, and the Immigration Department for the provisions of greater human capacity to safeguard the Virgin Islands and its borders. The joint multi-agency operation was, sent, was cemented on the 17th April 2020. The National Security Council, NSC, reviewed the recommendation for special allowance and agreed that a special security allowance in range of $400 to $600 be awarded to officers who are assigned to the Joint Task Force for the additional functions being executed, especially during this COVID period. This would apply to all officers, notwithstanding those presently receiving allowances, such as Task Force, national security over time, or senior head allowance. The Ministry of Finance, along with the Department of Human Resources Management, evaluated the decision made by the National Security Council and suggested that it would be financially prudent for Cabinet to approve a monthly allowance in the amount of $400. As such, Mr. Speaker, on 3rd March 2021, Cabinet approved the following. A, uh, Cabinet approved that a, a payment of a set monthly allowance to the eligible officers of the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, Her Majesty's Customs and Immigration Department assigned to the Joint Task Force 
in the amount of $400, notwithstanding officers who are currently in receipt of any additional allowances. That is Task Force National Security Overtime Senior Head. B, note that this, this special security allowance is to be funded by the various departments through the following heads and subheads for the length of the establishment of the Joint Task Force. Uh, Roman numeral 1, Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, heads 2118479, Police Operations and Administration, 2118480, Criminal Investigations, 2118482, Police, Community Policing, 2118483, Tactical Services, Subheads, Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, 511540, National Security Allowance, Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, 511412 over time. Two, Her Majesty's Custom Head, 23304125, Customs Administration, Subheads, HM Customs, 511516, Task Force Allowance, HM Customs, 511536, Head of Department Allowance, HM Customs, 511412, Overtime Allowance, Three, Roman numeral three, immigration head, two 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 three four zero nine eight, visa and residency services, two 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 three four zero nine nine, border control subheads, immigration five one one four one two, overtime allowance, immigration five one one five three six, head of department allowance. Mr. Speaker, the subheads mentioned above are currently within the three departments where funding has been identified readily to assist with facilitating immediate payment of the allowance. Mr. Speaker, I take this time to applaud all our law enforcement officers, among others, for the stellar work done during COVID-19 to keep us all safe. And I'll furnish you, Leader of the Opposition, with a detailed answer. Thank you. Thank you, Premier, for your comprehensive response. Um, just one, I have two follow-ups, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell me or tell this Honorable House, the people of the Virgin Islands, how long this task force has been in operation? Mr. Speaker, I don't want to misquote the House. I know it, 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 um, it was assembled during the COVID-19 uh, period, so that roughly would give it a few months now, that uh, probably just over seven months in operation. So it was assembled during that time. But re please remember that each unit still has its own legislation that govern them, but it was assembled to, so that we can try to protect these waters from persons getting in more so than anyone getting out. Okay. I won't hold you to the exact number, Premier, but, but my f second follow-up. So prior to, and you just said, and I, and I just listened to you read that the funding was approved on March 3rd. So prior to March 3rd, was any funding approved or identified to pay for this task force? Well, originally when it, was, when it was formed, that was not the agreement. It's after a while, a few months get going, given the immense task that was at hand, then is when that was um, agreed. So it would not stretch for the full duration of the JTF. It would only go to, I think, the last uh, three or four months, I'm not sure. I don't want to be quoted on the months but it's not the lifespan of the JTF. It's after a while when officers realize the magnitude and, and, it, and they were correct, and the time that they had to be put in, and uh, most of them had to be taken off a of vacation. So it was a lot of work and a lot of manpower needed to man the borders and keep us safe. So after a few months is when they decided that they have to be compensated for this, and that is when they, they, they got together and they brought a proposal and it was accepted. So it was not the full duration of the task force life. Okay, Premier. Um, thank you, Premier, for that response. I too would like to, before I move on, Mr. Speaker, thank the, the joint task force and our frontline staff for the work they do to keep us safe, not just in the law enforcement, but the health services as well. I think they do um, a very difficult job in very difficult circumstances. I think I'm happy to know that they're being, now being compensated um, for the additional hours and works that they put in on behalf of the people of this territory. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell the Honorable House what was the dollar amount for government revenue and total expenditure for the periods 1st January through 31st December 2018 1st January through 31st December 2019, and 1st January through 31st December 2020, respectively. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on 11 March 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Needless to say that this remains the same to date. COVID-19 has brought unprecedented financial challenges to all countries and territories worldwide, with the BVIB no exception. Mr. Speaker, we had to dip heavily into our own pockets. That is, the people of the Virgin Islands had to step up to the plate to do what we have always done for generations, fend for ourselves to navigate the new regular of living and working with COVID-19. The challenge, in, the challenge of, of balancing lives versus livelihood to date is one that all countries, all countries in the world are grappling with, and we thank God for his mercies. However, Mr. Speaker, 2020 did not end with a recurrent deficit. Your government was able to balance the budget from the following sources, reserve fund, contingency fund, CDB, rehabilitation and reconstruction loan and consolidated fund. So, Mr. Speaker, although the numbers would reflect that it would have seemed at face value a deficit, it was balanced based on those funds, and this year we are making sure that we pay particular attention to the, to the recurrent and expenditures to make sure that we don't have to dip back into those funds unless utmostly necessary. So, Mr. Speaker, the dollar amounts for unaudited total revenue and expenditure for the government of Bosnia over the periods of 1st January to 31st December in 2018 19 and 20 are in 2018 the revenue was 387,887 million 387 million just checking to see if you are following thank you um, 2018 the revenue was 387 million 899,534 dollars in 2019 the revenue was 363 million 916,421 dollars in 2020, of course, that's the year we were hit very hard with COVID-19. The revenue was $360,181,868. In that uh, same sequence, the expenditure in 2018 was $343,679,391. And then in 2019, the expenditure was $334,457,187. And uh, in 2020, when we had to put many measures in place, the expenditure was $390,332,240. Mr. Speaker, members are to be aware that the variance for the year 2020 between the revenue and the expenditure, recurrent and capital, was covered with funds from the reserve contingency consolidated funds in addition to the CDB rehabilitation and reconstruction loan, which must be taken in consideration when you're doing the budget. So, Mr. Speaker, in terms of doing a supplementary of giving more information, the reserve fund, uh, we, we were, had to use $7 million. The contingency fund, $5,927,007. The CDB rehabilitation and reconstruction loan accounted for $11,878,317. And the consolidated fund, in terms of what we had to use, was $5,345,048. Mr. Speaker, I will furnish the member with the information as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that um, comprehensive response, Premier. I have a follow-up question to this. Um, Premier, you, you just, the, the last bit of information you just mentioned in terms of the CDB and the reserve funds, um, in terms of $16 million, but the variance between 2019 and 2020 in terms of expenditure was some $56 million. No, 30, some, uh, close to $30 million. Well, well 2020, based on what I, I recall, 2019 was 334 million and 2020 was 390 million. Yeah. And the difference between year to year is about 56 million. You taught me maths and I, and I paid attention in class. So it's 56 million. So based on the 16 million um, that you just outlined from the funds and the CDB, there's a $40 million difference. Where, where, where did that money, was that money made up? Was that from the, the, the Social Security grant that was received by government? That's not accurate to look at it that way at all. The, remember, you cannot divorce 2020 from COVID. And what you're doing is looking at the expenditure per year, but you have to look at the revenue versus expenditure. So in 2018, the revenue versus expenditure, 
there was no um, variance in terms of when you subtract the expenditure from the revenue. In 2019, the same. There was no variance between when you subtract the expenditure from the revenue. But in 2020, based on COVID, which cannot be divorced from this conversation at all, there was an uh, expenditure of over uh, 390 million um, plus uh, for, for the choice of language. And in terms of the revenue, there was over 360 million. So it was just under 20 something million that the variance would have been between revenue and expenditure and not 50 something million dollars. That's if you look at it by year by year. But you cannot always look at expenditure year by year in that light in terms of how you just um, stated it to, to um, the Honorable House. So what I did with the, with the variance is, is detail how we covered that gap between the 360 million plus and the 390 million of revenue versus expenditure, not detailing it for year by year because each year covered itself. All right, <clears throat> all right, Premier. If we, if we, let's let's do it the way that you're suggesting. So the revenue for 2020 was 360 million dollars, and 260 million. 60. And the revenue for and the expenses for 300 and 2020 yeah. uh, is, is 390. Mm -hmm. That's a difference of 30 million. And based 29 on 29 million in change. Potato, potato. Yeah. Uh, so I said 29 million. Mm -hmm. And if you take away the 16 million dollars from based on the consolidated fund and based on the CDB loan program, you still have a, a difference of about $15 million. So where, 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 was that money, where did that money come from? Where did we get additional? You need to read all the amounts in the variance. I only read the ones that you, the ones you read out. And, and you, no, you, it's there on the paper. The so three there. variants are given on the paper, the, the consolidated fund, the reserve fund, and the CDB loan. The loan, the loan was already secured, though, right? That was funding that was already secured, so I'm, I'm, I'm still... Right. But, but in expenditures, we always count the loan as an expenditure. Okay. And so. Even, so, so that's automatically count as expenditure. So if we don't use that part of the loan, we also balance it off as a savings and that we didn't have to use it because we set back using some of it, given that it was COVID-19. So in the books, it can go either way. Right. I missed, I didn't, I didn't hear the, the piece about the consolidated fund, so I apologize. I missed that $5 million. No, I'm going to tell you everything. It's yeah. people's okay. money. I ain't going to miss a thing. Okay. All right. I'll move on. Question number five. What's this? this that was question number five. Question number six. No, we're on five. You're on five now? Yeah, yeah. I only missed one. Five. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier Minister of Finance please tell us humble house? What was the dollar amount for government revenue excluding financial services and total expenditure for the periods 1st January through 31st December 2018, 1st January through 31st December 2019, and 1st January through 31st December 2020, respectively? All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Notwithstanding the floods and hurricanes of, of 2017, the COVID-19 pandemic, the revenue of the government of the Virgin Islands continues to surpass the revised projected estimates for the periods 2018 to 2020. This is shown in the resilience of the people as they continue to recover from the catastrophic damage resulting from the 2017 disasters and the ability to adjust and cope with the challenges faced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, this does not remove the fact that many businesses are still experiencing challenges adjusting to the current economic environment, but it is your government's intention to provide assistance where possible through the various stimulus packages. Mr. Speaker, the dollar amounts for unaudited total revenue for government of the Virgin Islands, excluding financial services, is very important to state that excluding financial services and total expenditure for the periods 
of periods 1st January to 31st December 2018, 2019, and 2020 as follows. In terms of revenue in 2018, it was $157,843,541. In revenue for 2019, it was $158,911,014. In 2020, it was $170,431,514. In terms of expenditure, the expenditure was the same as in, in, in question four, because expenditures remain the same. So the expenditure was $343,679,391, and for 2018, for 2019, it was $334,457,457,187, and for 2020, if the expenditure was $390,332,240. So, Mr. Speaker, those are all the numbers, and I'll provide the Leader of the Opposition with a detailed um, response so I can entertain any other follow up. Thank you. Just one follow up, Premier. Um, $2020, mm -hmm. $170,000,000. Please explain. How can uh, we just announced, we were just saying earlier that things have dropped off and we had lockdown during COVID-19. So how revenue jumped from 158 to 170 in 2020, 2019 to 2020? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yeah. revenue was, we did some revenue measures and some of them brought in some money. But remember though, your question is void of financial services. So with, when you look at financial services revenue, it did drop because of being COVID. So that is what caused the, some of the variance that you were asking a question before, because financial services did not come in with a regular budget. We came with a revised budget. And with a revised budget, financial services performed well, but below what was originally estimated in two, for 2020. Now, in terms of uh, the expenditures of government, of course, expenditures in government increase significantly, not only for the BVI, but for every country beyond their expectations because you had to factor in the stimulus, you had to factor in all those uh, measures for, for, for border control, you had to factor in many other areas. So, yes, we continue to push revenue, but overall, the revenue was down. But when you put in financial services, in the next question that you have further on, you will see that overall revenue was done. But we continue to push some significant initiatives, um, whether it be through construction, through different areas. And government was able to do business with some of the amendments we came in here and make that we were able to push forward with some revenues for 2020 beyond um, the other years. But overall, revenue was done. Premier, you'll have to show me those details because it's virtually impossible for us to be shut down since March, just opened up our territory in December, many of the businesses were closed, and you're telling me that tourism did better in 20, all the other revenue owners. The key owners are, mm -hmm. I'm not finished, construction, mm -hmm. um, through tourism, through um, the passenger tax, and other, other measures, that you're saying that we had a 20, it's um, 12, $12 million increase during a time when we were shut down during COVID, during a time when uh, we didn't open up. We haven't opened up until the end of December 2020. We made $12 million more than the year before, since March. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you look at it in isolation, like that is yes. But without uh, going into details so that those can be furnished at another time, we did have some unexpected sales in natural resources and labor that came up with some, some stamp duty. We did have some other things coming on to the end of the year of 2020 that increased the revenue um, in terms of the re revenue, not the recurrence, sorry, that increased revenue. So there were some factors that increased revenue. But, the, but at the end of the day, when you add a revenue together with the financial services, revenue still was down. But there are some factors that came in last minute that increased the revenue from where normal times were. So we were grateful for those initiatives that brought in that money. But I don't want it to be connotated that we 
did so good during COVID-19 because COVID-19 expenditures had increased significantly. So that there was not a balance at all. It was not a wash. It was good that we did some more that we didn't have a bigger variance. But at the same time, overall revenue was down in 2020. Premier, I, I hear you, but I can't see how this is possible. But I'll, ask, I'll be back again with a question to get the details because if tourism was shut down from March of 2020 and virtually still shut down because we only opened up the airport in Bifalan, and you're saying that between that period, we are able to get $12 million additional in, in other revenue measures. I don't know what they were. And I'll, I'll be back with a subsequent question to get the details of what these specific measures that makes up this $170 million. Because I, I, can't, I can't see it. I, I don't. Well, well, you can't see it because I didn't give it to you to see. When you ask a question, we won't bring what brought the excess. Is, revenue doesn't deal with excess like that. We will bring what all make up the 170 so that you can see. But there are other areas that came in. Financial services, I mean, for example, you are saying that um, tourism was down. Yes, tourism was down, but there are some other revenue makers. And also on top of that, there was some other revenue that was to be collected in 2019 that was collected now. So when you do ask the question, you'll get the full details. But I want to make it clear, overall revenue was down. We will see when I come back. Question number seven. Six. 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 I, I don't know why yeah, man, you don't need to skip questions. I don't uh, skip none. Question number six. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier and Minister of Finance please tell us on the House what was the recurrent expenditure for the government of the Virgin Islands for each month from January through September 2020? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I forget that I should have um, cleared something up, too. Remember, the stimulus package from what was received up to those times would have factored in in revenue, too, because under the books, it would have come in under revenue. So don't forget the, the Social Security stimulus would have come in under revenue and go through expenditure also. So don't forget that factor. So I needed to say that, and uh, it, it slipped me, but that is also part of it. But when you ask that question, you'll get the full details. But question six, I wouldn't, um, you, you nearly missed it, but I thank you that you did it. Mr. Speaker, the unaudited recurrent expenditure for the government of the Virgin Islands for each month from January through September 2020 are as follows. January, $22,439,504. February, $23,164,064,758. March, $24,968,193. April, $19,581,015. May, $27,510,240. June, $27 million, thank you. $510,240. June, $25,552. $1,847. July, $47,639,027. Right, and let me say it again. July, $47,639,027. August, $25,231,582. September, $26,841,814. A total of $242,928,000. $1,980. Mr. Speaker, on average, the monthly recurrent expenditure is $24 million. However, just like in the previous question, members may notice that in July, the recurrent expenditure was above the normal average to the tune of $47 million. This can be attributed to the COVID-19 provisional spending, which was approved by a schedule of appropriation number one of 2020, resolution 16 of 2020, which would have included some of the stimulus money at that time, which would have uh, account for why some of the, the expenditure jump in July, and also it would have been reflected in the revenue also. Okay. Thanks, Premier. Um, Premier, you, so, so that, 40, that jump was attributed to recurrent spending versus, um, I, I'm, I'm trained, I'm a little... 
the jump would have been attributed to both because how the government accounts work. Once you are given a grant, it's going to go into a grant, but it's also going to be recorded as revenue until you spend it. And then when you spend it, it's going to go under expenditure. Might I add that the 40 million from Social Security, at the 17.5 million of that, contrary to what we hear on the street, did not initially come over to the government of the Virgin Islands. It stayed with Social Security. So really and truly, only 22 million, 22.5 million dollars came over. 10 million Social Security used to pay the unemployment benefits. And 7.5 million dollars went to pay uh, NHI for monies that they weren't paid, finished paid from the time they were start up and other bills that they had. So um, although the government has been accused of spending 40 million dollars of Social Security money, only $22.5 million really came, come over. Thank you. The question asks about the current premier. So that's why I'm asking if, if that, the, the, the numbers have been consistent um, from January to, to December, except for July. So that additional, well, almost $20 million was attributed to recurrent spending, or, or, or was it to, to do a machine, machinery? You said it's COVID related. Was right. it to do something in a hospital? I, I don't. No, no. I'm trying to understand how it comes recurrent spending. Okay. When the money is received, it goes under. It is an income, so it goes under revenue. But if you receive the 22.5 million dollars, that is under the revenue section. But if you only spend out of it, that is only what you can record at that time. So not because you receive the $22.5 million mean that you spend all of it at that time. So you could receive 22.5, but the expenditure might only show that you spend 12 million, but you still have to spend the 22.5 because it was specifically tasked to be for COVID relief funds. So it could be uh, spent for nothing else. But in the books of government, whenever it receives money, whether grant or otherwise, it must be properly recorded as coming in and, and, and labeled under revenue. And then as it goes out, it must be recorded what it goes out for. That is why we can account for every dime that is received from Social Security. That I understand, Premier. But, but the question asks, what was the recurrent expenditure for the period? Um, yeah. not, not the inflows and outflows. Um, and the number for that particular month was $47 million. So I, I don't understand how, what, what was it attributed to as a recurrent expenditure for an additional $20 million? The money started to be spent for, for, for the stimulus. Let me explain something also further. The full 40 million have to be accounted for in government's accounts. So although now the government received $40 million, which would go down as a revenue because it came in, Although Social Security is keeping $7.5 million of it, it has to be shown that it's paid back out to Social Security for the 17.5. It sounds a little awkward, but it's accounting. So although it is money coming to government and it has to go back to Social Security, one would ask, why not leave it by Social Security one time? But Social Security have to send all over and government send back so that it's reflected in the books as the $40 million grant, although Social Security will be the steward of it. So it will be based on how much money was paid in at that time because all the grant wasn't received at the same time. The full 40 million was not received one time. The full 22.5, everything wasn't received one time. So the amount that was received, then there were expenditures that were starting to be expended as a result of that. All right, Premier, I'm not an accountant and I'm sure the accountants will verify this information. Question number seven. Mr. Speaker, could our Premier Minister of Finance please tell us on the House the following. A. How many applications were received from businesses seeking a grant from the Business Grant Program as of the 31st of December 2020? And B. Of the applications received, how many of those applicants received a notification advising them that they were approved to receive a grant? And C. Of the applications, how many received notification that they were denied? 
and D of the applicants who received an approval notification, how many of them actually received a grant check? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact the business sector of the Virgin Islands economy. Mr. Speaker, businesses are, imp are important for driving economic activity in any economy. Businesses provide jobs which enable employees to meet their social and financial needs. Mr. Speaker, according to the data compiled on businesses following a business impact survey conducted in April 2020, losses in monthly revenue of about $35 million was reported. Losses in the tourism industry accounted for 60% or $21 million of this loss for the industry. Preliminary projections for losses in tourism revenue for 2020 based on limited tourist arrivals could reach over $230 million. Mr. Speaker, the response to the business grant stimulus was so overwhelmingly positive, it required extending the deadline by which businesses could submit an application for, access, for assistance. The first quarter of applications received total 1,239 1, businesses applying for grant assistance. The second quarter received a result of the extension of the deadline for submitting applications resulted in an additional, an additional 644 grant applications being received. Mr. Speaker, combined a total of 1,883 business ap grant applications were received. Mr. Speaker, of the applications received, a total of 1,258 applicants have received notice that they were approved to receive grant. Mr. Speaker, no business received of any official notification that they were denied. Mr. Speaker, were all 1,258 businesses that were notified as approved and have received their grant checks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, Premier, for um, your response. I just, just want to make sure I have the numbers right. So 12, so you had, you had 1883 applications and 1250, let me just make sure I have the numbers right. Bear with me, Mr. Speaker. Take your time. Yes, I have the numbers right. So you received 1883 in business grant applications and 1258 received notifications of checks, receiving checks, and you're saying that all 1258 have received checks thus far. That was uh, as of today, because I got notices from persons who received notice that they did not receive checks. So, so are, we, are, we, are we confirmed that this information is accurate? As far as what they have given me, Mr. Speaker, that is what I have reported. Those that uh, I reported the number who have received, but there are also a number that have not received, and they have not stated to them as yet that they, they have not received anything because no official correspondence has, have gone out. So I can only report to you what the information on file that they have given me thus far with it because it is a, a very heavy process and I want to thank all those involved who have been making the payments because that shows that quite a bit of businesses in the BVI were able to benefit from the grant. But still there are a lot more suffering and we yeah. do understand that. Thank you, Premier. So there's a, a difference of over 600 businesses that applied that didn't get any denied notification. Um, um, Whatever the number is. Yeah, I don't six know something, is. yeah. So what is, the, what is the plan to deal with how we're going to address those businesses? Are we, are we going to respond mm -hmm. to them? Are we going to say something to them in terms of their application? What, what is the, the government's plan on dealing with those six something businesses? Well, the answer is yes, they must get a response one way or the other. But remember, the COVID-19 grant program is still ongoing. And the, the other area that we have to recognize is that some persons um, would have put in for multiple trade licenses. And, and some decisions had to be made with well, right, allow them, if they had seven trade licenses, we know maybe seven different businesses, but, but um, we cannot allow one person to go with seven checks. So, so there was also a decision to try to space it out to make sure at least um, many persons across the diaspora of the BVI got some kind of stimulus um, check from the, from the stimulus grant that we were doing. So the answer is yes, it is still ongoing and still communications will be made. 
Thank you, Premier. And I, and, I, and I hope that, I think that information is, that you just raised is pertinent because I hope that these 600 persons or thereabouts are persons, um, aren't persons who are, are seeking multiple assistance um, for their multiple businesses, but persons who, if there are persons there who haven't gotten any checks at all, that we, we find a way to ensure we get some support to those businesses because as we all know, the challenges that businesses are facing currently um, in this current climate. And it's been, we're, we're now a year in March, when officially in March, so we're a year in COVID and, and, and the impacts of COVID are real. Thank you, Leader Opposition. And I do agree, we have to help our business as much as possible, but don't forget to look at the glass as half full also, because we did help quite a number of businesses with more to go. So, so I know that you're gonna thank us for of those course. thousand and change that we have helped. But the other 600 and change, we're gonna to try to make sure we get to them. So, so I want to congratulate those thousand and change that were able to get some help and the others, we're working furiously to see what is possible to, to make sure that everybody gets some kind of help. Thank you, Premier. At least some hope to them as well, because many of them have reached out. I know they reached out to other members as well in terms of their concern. And I'm sure that those persons who receive assistance are grateful for the assistance. And, and we know that, and I want to thank um, the process, the government and the process for what they've done so far. But I think we need to, to get and wrap up and get additional assistance to those businesses. Question number eight. Mr. Speaker, could our Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please provide this Honorable House with a detailed breakdown of the revenues received from financial services, from the Financial Services Commission between January 1st through December 31st, 2018, January 1st through December 31st, 2019, and January 1st through December 31st, 2020. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I really thank the Leader of Opposition for asking these questions because it is the people's money, and as you can see that the I'm producing for him detailed responses with nothing to hide. Mr. Speaker, given the uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and the potential adverse impact to the financial services industry, it would have been expected that due to all these factors, there would have been a, be a decline in the projected revenues in financial services in 2020. Mr. Speaker, the Business Continuity Act was amended in 2020 to allow the financial services industry to continue business in the midst of pandemics such as COVID-19. This amendment paid dividends as revenue collection for 2020 outperformed the revised projections. And please note, I say the revised projections. During COVID-19, special emphasis was placed on financial services, among other areas, where many provisions were made to accommodate the industry. On 14 July 2020 and 21st, July 2020, two public statements were delivered by the Minister of Finance to show up the industry and boost confidence in all of the industry stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, the detailed breakdown of the revenues received from the Financial Services Commission between January 1st to December 31st, 2018, 2019, in the same time frame, and 2020, at detail in, in Table 3, receipts recorded by the Commission. And I want to state, Mr. Speaker, that I actually went and do it detail so that you can see how much came in from each year in all categories, registry of corporate affairs, banks and judiciary, insolvency business, insurance business, investment business, and the whole nine years. So it's a very detailed but spreadsheet. Can you, can you give me the broad numbers, though, Premier, in terms of they should have the, the, the total? Uh, 2018, $230,055,983. dollars 2019, $205 million, uh, five, $5,407, and 2020, $189,750,000, million, $750,349. But you can hold all of these, which the $189,750,349 is much more, give it to me, is much more than um, is more than um, than we I had. Speak. Yeah, given that, given that, yeah, no, given that, is much more than we had to do with the revised budget. Because you would recall that when COVID-19 hit, we had to revise the budget because we recognized that um, we would have been losing revenue, like every country. 
Uh, we would have had to adjust it or or spending patterns and our revenue intake like every country because of COVID-19. And we projected lower figures, which was passed by this House for financial services. But we also made sure that we passed the amendment to the, um, to the Continuity Act to try to allow, to allow them to do business during the lockdown and accommodate as much as we can. So the 189750 $189,750,349 uh, came up a little more than the revised amount. However, it was less than the, the regular projected amount for 2020, and of course, that's because of COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, 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 num the dip is, and, and, I, and I, I appreciate that explanation from it. But the, the, the drop is significant. Um, in terms of our plans, uh, what, and, and uh, he probably didn't prepare for this, but what are we doing to sort of show up or create additional opportunities in this space? I know that we now have the challenges with beneficial ownership through the United Kingdom, and we have the additional challenge with the EU and, 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 and the threat of blacklisting us as a, as a jurisdiction. What are we doing in terms of this trying to level off or create different avenues within this in particular industry to, to stop this precipitous drop that we're seeing here with financial services. Mr. Speaker, the member would know that financial services was predicted to have challenges from as far as about 10 years out, and um, they are now here. And the member would know that the need to have diversified the economy was something that was even in the McKenzie report, which was done in the member's time. And Mr. Speaker, there's no secret that we have to diversify the economy, and there are many ways that we're looking to diversify the economy, even to diversify existing industries and to create linkage industries. That is one of the reasons that we're working very hard on the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry, because it's going to be a very good new linkage industry to add into the, ship, the, the, the financial services industry. Another area is that we're looking about some other new facets of the same financial services industry within the economic substance realm that we also see that could bring more revenue for financial services and overall for the territory. So there are many areas that we can do that we are working on to help. But I must say this, Mr. Speaker, while we are diversifying the, the economy in this area and other areas so that we can increase our, our revenue that will be lost, the, the loss that was here, Mr. Speaker, was largely due to COVID-19. The, the issue that you had with financial services in 2020 was that unlike Irma, when Irma hit the BVI, it only hit one or two other islands, but the BVI was the hardest hit. The whole world was okay. So the whole world could have continued business and, and continue um, doing what they have to do, our revenues continued in financial services, and everything still came out to be just about normal. The difference with COVID-19 is the whole world was hit. So, so there was a time that doing business in financial services in the whole world was an issue. Hong Kong was shut down. Um, every, everywhere Asia was shut down. Everywhere was affected. China was shut down. So, so it cannot be looked at with a decline in isolation just because of those other areas. The heavy decline of that came as a result of COVID-19. It cannot be divorced. However, the fact still remains that we have to continue to do what we are doing to show up that industry as well as many other industries that we are working on. Um, there are some projections with Virgin Islands Shipping Registry. There are some projections with other areas that we will be running forward that we see will be able to help because the only way to get out into the new paradigm shift of financial prosperity in this BVI is through innovation, so some of them are not going to be the regular avenues and um, may be met with some resistance, but we have to press forward nonetheless. Thank you, Premier. Um, it, but in terms of the, I hear you, Premier, and I hear your response, and the, your response is a response, but the pace of drop uh, from 2019 to 21 was much slower um, than it was in 2018 to 2019. And I think I can't say that COVID-19, if, if the case was COVID-19 was an issue, you would have seen a more accelerated drop. Um, um, I, I hear that the plans that you have in terms of economic substance and the other things, but I think we need to, now I don't have a specific question, but I think we need to 
to um, continue on the road to diversifying that particular industry to sort of slow the drop in, in, in how we could sustain our financial services industry. Well, well, what I would say is this year so far, the, the pro progress of financial services is almost back up to the average norm. So for me, looking at it analytically, thus far, I would have to attribute most of that drop to COVID-19. Yes, there are other challenges in the industry caused the drop in the other years, but we're going to diversify. We are diversifying as well. I mentioned some of them already, with much more of them to come. But at the end of the day, we cannot just look at this industry alone like before. Um, the, we have to make sure that we are innovative with a lot of areas to increase revenue. And some of them are being worked on right now. Some of them require legislative changes that are um, being looked at at the Attorney General's office with some other areas and new legislation so that we could come forward with them. At that time, I'll speak more about them. But yes, um, this has been, been um, projected by many persons of the need to diversify our economy. Uh, and we're, we're, we're working hard at that, and the record will show for the two years that we're here, we have not even got 30 days good to, to enjoy a, a month into the government. Um, so we hit the ground running, and COVID-19 came right in not too long after. So we we'll continue to push ahead, and I must commend the Ministry of Finance staff uh, for, for being vigilant with the finances, because when we look, let's do comparison. When we look at all our other Caribbean brothers and sisters and look at many of them that we are continuing being told that we need to be like, which with due respect, I respect that they are doing their best to, to get revenues. But we still are doing very, very good compared to them. Unlike the United States or America or even UK, we don't print money. So we have to continue to be innovative on how to, to increase revenues, how to control expenditures and how to move forward and that we have been doing and it is a challenge because we're not immune. Show me any country in the world that is making it now financially without these challenges. You show that to me and then I will study the model very extensively. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we, we just need to continue to do the work to, to help show up these industries and I continue to push to get the specifics in terms of how we intend to do that. Question number nine. Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance please tell this Honorable House what was the number balance of the consolidated fund and the reserve fund as of, Jan as of July 31st, 2017, February 28, 2019, March 1st, 2020, respectively? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the number balance on the consolidated fund and reserve fund as of July 31st, 2017, February 28, 2019, March 1st, 2020 is as follows. Um, the, in July 31st, 2017, the consolidated fund was 8,824,251 dollars. In February 28th of 2019, is 62,040,776 dollars. And March 1st, 2020 was $63,509,563. I would say, though, when the consolidated fund, and we're talking about that, Mr. Speaker, no matter what government is in place, the balance on that really is always misleading because it's like your checkbook, as I stated earlier. It doesn't always factor in, if you, uh, Mr. Speaker, when you get your statements from the bank, unless those checks that you wrote out at that time came in, it may always it usually reflects a higher balance, but there are a lot of expenditures still outstanding. That is the way the government accounts works and everyone accounts works. So although the figures would seem high or low in some areas, it depends on what revenue was coming in, when it was coming in, and what expenditures were coming out and when they came out. In July 31st, 2017, the reserve fund was 66 million. $532,731. In February 28, 2019, the reserve fund at that time was $59,750,558. And March 1st, 2020, the reserve fund 
was $79,073,912, Mr. Speaker. But please note that these exclude dormant account balances. I didn't put in the dormant account balances in them because you know that persons could still claim. Those used to be given to me when I was in opposition as part of the, the um, balances, but, but I took them out because dominant accounts, people could still come for their money. I have no, um, I have no further follow-up on this particular question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Premier for answering all the questions in kind and keeping with the theme that we're going paperless and we're, we're revolutionizing the way that we do business as a government and as a territory. I will ask that these answers be sent to me electronically, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will oblige, and you would know that I put some money in the budget this year to make sure the whole House of Assembly go paperless. That's innovation. That is your government working for you. Thank you. You, you really can't help yourself. Uh, I thank the <laughs> Premier for answering the question put forward by the Leader of the Opposition. I now invite the Leader of the Opposition to pose his questions to the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question one. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please tell the Sambal House what is, what, is, what is his ministry's plan to fix the deplorable road conditions in the Eastern Lalo community, leading from Hope Hill to Palm Town, Greenland, and from Sophie Bay to Eastern Lalo Police Station, inclusive of timeline? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, the road networks throughout the Virgin Islands were severely damaged by the storms, hurricanes of 2010 and 2017. Subsequent to each of these storms, loan funds for the repairs of retention walls and road stabilization were sought and secured from the Caribbean Development Bank. It is quite unfortunate that the works from Hope Hill to Little Dix Hill were not completed in the years following the receipt of these funds. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform this Honorable House that substantial works are now contracted and are being completed in accordance with the terms of each of the contracts. I further assure you, Mr. Speaker, that the rehabilitation of the road works in each of the remaining areas in, questions, in question are included in the comprehensive road network plans for the territory. In the interim, the Public Works Department will continue to temporarily repair the road networks as identified to provide an ease to motorists. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, you will be aware that the road overlays have been conducted through the seven and the eight districts since taking office in 2019. Further, Mr. Speaker, you will be aware that substantial resources were required to combat and contain the, effort, the effects of COVID-19, which was declared a global pandemic on March 11, 2020, and continues to date. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I got my two follow-up. Mr. Speaker, I see the, um, the Minister for Transportation has resorted to throwing shade. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister, I understand that 2010, 2017, and the CDB loan project and how that process works, the roads that were undermined um, are roads that are being fixed. And that process, as he knows, is very extensive in terms of the design work and the procurement for contractors for that particular work. But I'm speaking about works that didn't include the CDB road project works. In particular, there's a particular road area at um, Hope Hill where, where uh, a fellow member lives. And, and we've been patching that particular road for eons. And, I, and I'm, I was happy to see, upon receipt of the question, that the road was subsequently patched. Um, and what will happen again if we don't fix that, pat, that road in a comprehensive way? it is going to be at the same point within the next six weeks. So I hope that the minister, and I know he's a progressive individual, a progressive young man, he's not gonna take the patch and go approach and come up with a comprehensive solution that includes the roads that do not 
that not, is, that's not included in the CDB road network infrastructure improvement. I'm sorry, is that, is that the first follow-up question? Yeah. Okay, so I, no, I'm waiting to hear the comprehensive approach to address the roads that are not included in the CDB. The roads included in, in that particular stretch of road, Mr. Speaker, is the road at Hope Hill, um, three pieces of road on Hope Hill, and there's a particular piece of road uh, in Little Dix Hill. And there's the road network from that area continue to go into um, the east end to the police station isn't a part of the CDB loan program. Um, so I want to know and, and I want to know what the minister's intent in terms of dealing with those issues in a comprehensive way, rather the patch and grow approach that we've been seeing, specifically with the area in Hope Hill that needs to be addressed in a more um, substantial way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank the, the member for the comprehensive um, process in terms of how the CDB operates. And Mr. Speaker, yes, we have been doing remedial work. And some of the areas that the member is, is speaking about, he is aware that I think up where he mentioned up on the Hope Hill, I think that is a, a leaking pipe that needs to be repaired. But Mr. Speaker, he will be aware that that is something that we have been trying to address um, since taking office. And he mentioned that it has been uh, patched the other day. But if there is no leak, then I think the patch would, would hold up. But it's something that public work is aware of, like all the roadways in the territory. And Mr. Speaker, we have made um, headway in terms of, of getting the, 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 the resources readily available so that we can have all the, road work, the roadways addressed in the territory. And like I mentioned, COVID-19 uh, played a part in terms of, of securing the, the additional uh, machineries. Mr. Speaker, we purchased an asphalt plant. We are uh, to purchase a, a, a new paver, a new milling machine. Uh, we are working so that we can have all the, all the equipment in place so that we can go in and actually do a, a whole comprehensive um, repair to the roadways. So Mr. Speaker, yes, in the interim, we have been doing remedial work so that the, the motorists can have an ease in the as they traverse the, the territory's roadway. And uh, we can't forget that we are going through COVID, Mr. Speaker. Yes, and uh, we will work to, to have, as he mentioned, address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just a second follow-up. The, the specific road in Hope Hill and the road by the police, the, the community center, those are the two main areas that continuously in, in that space, and particularly coming from Parakita Bay, going into um, the, the police station in... Um, Parakita Bay? Yeah, yeah that's, that was included in the question, from Sophie Bay um, to the Eastern, Eastern Police Station. So that entire stretch from Parakita Bay to the police station continues to have an issue. Um, I think we need to come up with a comprehensive solution for addressing that issue from the college, come straight up to, to the... Um, to the the police station, and particularly the, east, the area from the community center to the... I'm sorry, little of oxygen. Is that, is that a question you're asking, or that's a I'm, recommendation? I'm, I'm asking what the solution is for those particular areas. Okay, I want to understand, I'm understand getting, the question. I'm get, yeah, I'm getting to... to you're getting to the question. Uh, so I have to, to, to set up the question. Oh. <laughs> I'm getting to the question, Mr. Speaker. You're getting there. Okay, well... <laughs> So, so that I get there soon. Bear, 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 bear with me there. Speaker. I bear with you. I, I, be, be you patient, know, I don't want to, you know, say yeah. that we're not going to have any editorial. We're going to ask questions, but I'm, I'm working with you, leader of the opposition. Okay. But please get to the question as soon as you can. I'm building up. Yeah. So from, so from the, as I mentioned, from the police station by the, the, the community center, that particular area and the East Yacht Hopel, as, you, as you're well aware, um, the pipe, leaking pipe is under the road. So if we continue to patch on top of the leaking pipe is going to continue to erode. So I, I think we need to, need to understand what the intention is in terms of the long-term fix for those two particular areas. Um, Mr. Speaker, we haven't answered by committee. Uh, no, we, we I'm haven't. trying to follow with you. I'm, I'm hearing a statement instead of a question. So I'm asking what the plan is specifically okay. for the areas that I outlined. Okay. From Sophie Bay, Parakeet, including Parakeet Bay, and the road, that stretch of road from um, 
the college to the, to the um, police, police station. And from the police station where the, so the, um, the, the community center is, and they specifically that particular issue in Hope Hill, where the pipe that is leaking is under the road. And if we don't fix the leaking pipe on the road, we'll have the same situation again in six weeks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yet again, I'm aware that the leaking pipe, we don't really have pipes standing on top of the road, so we expect it to be under the road, and we have looked into addressing you the sure leaking pipe. Sure well, Mr. That? Speaker, in regards to the other areas that the member is, is asking about, he's quite aware that we are working on the Eastern Long Look Sewage Project, and those areas would have to be dug up, Mr. Speaker. So once we get then, uh, we are right now, we have um, the AHDP pipes alongside the same road from Parakita Bay that we'll be laying those pipes shortly. So what I can ask the residents in the area is for additional patience as we work to, to install the, the, sewage, the sewage lines, and even in the area from, the, from the, uh, the police station there, we will be doing lateral lines as well. So it'll be a, a, a bit of wastage if we go in and actually do the overlays for those roads right now for us to then go and take them back up. So Mr. Speaker, that is a part of the, the, the entire fix for the Eastern Long Look Sewage Project that we are um, feverishly working on so that we can get that, that accomplished. But the, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response. But those areas that I in question, uh, the majority of those areas specifically by the Kermity Center and going in Greenland have already installed all the lines and the lateral lines in those areas. So the issue is not an issue of the sewage. It's the issue of us addressing the road, particularly there by the, the, the electrical station where the road is severely undermined and will collapse at any moment by, in the Greenland area. So it's not an issue of sewage for the roads in those areas. I, I, I'm sorry. It seems question, like question number you're two. You're asking the question and you're no. answering the question for him. So I, I, I'm a little confused, but, but I want, I want need, the public needs to have clarity, and the lines have already been. The minister said that the lines are to be installed, but the lines have already been installed by the, the community center. They've already been installed in Greenland, and the lateral lines have already been installed for the majority of the portion of the road in Greenland that is in question. Okay, I'll allow the minister to clarify, and then we'll move on. Seeing that your two supplementary has been. Uh, Mr. Used. Speaker, the, the, the member, um, you know, he's educating me as to what is installed, so I would have to get confirmation before I, I um, give a, a proper response. But I'm aware that <clears throat> based on the plan, we have to still run lines to each person's home. So there still need to be some sort of interruption in the road and some um, disturbance to the road so that we can get those, those lateral lines into the homes. So we still have to do some um, digging up of the roadway in, in those areas. As far as I, w I was, I'm aware, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation, Works and Utilities please tell us on what is what is his ministry's plan to fix the deplorable road conditions at the entrance leading to Little Dix Hill, inclusive of timeline? Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, the road network short of Virginians was severely damaged by the storms of 2010 and 2017. Hence, territory-wide road work repairs remain ongoing. Mr. Speaker, as the Ministry of Transportation, Works and Utilities continues continue to bring relief to the motoring public by addressing the deplorable road conditions, a schedule has been formulated for execution, and I, would, I wish to advise the honorable member that the works should have commenced earlier this week. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that. I think that road was in really bad shape, and I, and I think that will bring some relief to the residents who live in the Lambert Little Dicks um, area. I thank you for that, Minister. Question number three. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works, and Utilities please tell this Honorable House, with the increase in traffic to Long Bay Beach at B. Fallon, 
What is the ministry's plan to fix the deplorable road condition to the access road leading to the beach for tourists and residents to enjoy the comfortable access, enjoy a comfortable access inclusive of timeline? Mr. Speaker, I am quite pleased that the leader of the opposition, my eight district colleague, would seek to determine the ministry's plan to fix the access road leading to the Long Bay Beach. So, Speaker, as the member is aware, and if he's not aware, the past, for the past 10 years and more, this property is privately owned, notwithstanding consistent with the immediate past government Public Works Department will continue to grade the area to make it comfortable for residents to traverse, for resident, comfortable for the residents and tourists alike to access uh, this area. Thank you, Minister. And I want to, at this time, if I may, Mr. Speaker, just thank the Minister for Health, the, the Minister for Natural Resources and Labor. I didn't ask you the question, but thank you for getting the restroom facility completed in that area. In fact, just in time for members when they go in on that road right now in the bumps to just use the facility because um, the facility is that bad at this time, my honorable colleague. But I think what I would suggest is, and you and I spoke about this, is to use a different material on that particular road. One of the things that we used to do is use uh, a mix of quarry waste, um, um, terrace, and cement that made it a little more durable. It lasts a lot longer. And there's some issues with drainage as well. I think we should try to seek to address those, those issues because the beach is heavily used by persons throughout the territory. And I think we need to get that particular facility and the roads into that facility up and running. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, we're working well. I'm sorry, Premier, you have a question? Intervention? Intervention. Um, Oh, okay. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Minister for Transportation, Works, and Utilities please give this Honorable House the following. An update on the Eastern Lollock Sewage Program and where his ministry is in the process. B, based on the fact that the majority of the work remaining is in, the eight, in District 8, would the representative be included in the process? C, please provide a timeline on when this project will commence? And D, could the minister also provide a detailed plan for the work that will be con conducted? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is unfortunate that funds were depleted from this project head and credited to the cruise payer project prior to this government taking office in 2019. Up, so, I'm Speaker, today I am happy to inform this Honorable House that these funds are finally being replaced. It is important to state that the execution of this project has been affected by COVID-19. Nonetheless, the Ministry of Transportation Works and Utilities continues to progress with the Eastern Long Look Sewage Project. In short order, we will be setting out to fence the staging area, procure containers for storage of fittings and material, and conducting a final inventory of material available at the Parakita Bay site. Mr. Speaker, it is expected that the works to install the last segment of the HDPE force main lines will commence in a couple of weeks. B. Mr. Speaker, yes, the Honorable Member will continue to be included in the process, and my ministry will provide regular updates as well as seek to involve the Honorable Member in community meetings and relevant site visits. C. Mr. Speaker, it's expected that civil works will commence at the end of March 2021 with the installation of approximately 950 linear feet of 8-inch force main lines. Mr. Speaker, it is anticipated that the project will last a period of 12 months. D, Mr. Speaker, a detailed plan for the work and task to be con conducted for the project is provided to the Honorable Member at App Appendix B. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's unfortunate again that my colleague and good friend would resort to, to playing political football with such an important project to the people of my community. They've been suffering long enough, and I think we need to always speak the facts. I'm sorry, is that a question to the... Yeah, the question is coming. The question is coming. The question is coming. Okay. And, and the fact is, is that, say, for $2 million from that money that was, that was taken away, was returned to, um, to the central government, and funding was provided in the CDB loan program to facilitate that project. So I want to make sure that the record is clear, Mr. Speaker, that the money was put back, say for $2 million. I'm sorry. To the two, I'm get that project going. I'm hearing a statement. The question is coming. The question is coming. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker. So this is your follow-up now. It has arrived. It's, it's part of the follow-up. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I heard the Premier give us equally just now. Give what? A sequelally. Oh, I don't. I can't understand that word. Okay. Yeah. You, you, the speaker, you understand that word. You like the right letters. But I, I'm saying you, 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 you're well aware. There's two follow up, and, and I'm coming, Mr. Speaker. We'll just want to stay away from statements. There'll be time on the other business. You can. I, I, I sat you six other statements today. Mr. Speaker, um, can I, can the minister, please tell us, um, so minister, you're saying that you have the, the plan in Appendix B. Can you, can you share it with me now, or? We're supposed to have it. If not, I'll get it. You don't have it right now? I am sure. Um, okay, I expect to, Mr. Speaker, I, if, uh, as usual, Mr. Speaker, can I get the plan? Uh, I asked for this plan from Standing Finance. Can I get it electronically as well, Minister? Okay, Minister, you said you have it now, or are you going to supply it later? I'll supply it. I think he's supposed to have it. But you have it? Okay. In the interim, while he looks for it, you have it? if you have a follow-up. I, 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 I don't have the details. Okay. The I'm, I'm the told details. it's not here, Minister, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that before, hopefully before we adjourn. Okay. Do what's all right? Okay, it's fine. We'll get it before we adjourn, hopefully. So if you could get your people to get it down to us. The Minister, if you could, you could send that to me electronically as well, I'll, I'll tr truly appreciate that. Question number five. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please tell this Honorable House, with tourism being one of our main economic pillars and the Trillers Bay being the gateway to many of our tourist destinations, please advise what is the Ministry's plan to fix the deplorable road conditions, the deplorable condition of the two parking lots and access road, which are utilized by our residents and visitors inclusive of timeline. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that my good friend and my colleague, the Leader of the Opposition and 8th District Rep would seek to determine the Ministry's plan to fix the parking lots at Trellis Bay. Mr. Speaker, you may be aware that the parking lots at Trellis Bay has gone unaddressed for years, preceding the tenure of this government and during the last 14 months there exists a global pandemic which has reaped havoc on world economies. Mr. Speaker, I assure you that interim measures will continue to be taken to address the parking lots and road conditions in this area. Mr. 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 Speaker, the minister should not seek to misrepresent the facts to the people of this territory. Those roads have been fixed every year in that area. To say that they go unfixed for years, Mr. Speaker, is a misrepresentation of the fact, a misrepresentation of the truth. It is unbecoming of my dear friend and the minister for the subject. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I, I'm, the rule is a question is posed to the minister, the minister answers the question, and then you ask to, you are allowed at the discretion of the speaker to follow up questions. So you ask the question, he answers, and you're reacting to a statement, you're making a statement and you're not asking a follow up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank the member for, for correcting, but I'm re Answering as I, I got the question, so Mr. Speaker, if, if there's misrepresentation, is not um, uh, willfully being willfully done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My dear friend, you should not, should not allow yourself to be misled like that. If it's this, this information is going to the public, and the public is listening. You should not seek to mislead the public. Question number six. Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please update this Honorable House 
on the ministry's plan to fix the undermined road at Shepherds Hill, which is a critical junction, a critical, which is at a critical junction and poses a danger to the residents of this area, inclusive of Timeline. Mr. Speaker, the condition of this question number six, right? Six. Number six. The condition of the Shepherd Hills, Shepherd's Hill Roadway has been temporarily remedied with a barrier in the interim while we finalize the permanent solution inclusive of the legal procedures since this is a private estate road. Speaker, does the Minister for Transportation has any timeline in terms of this? completion of the process because if you're aware, Minister, I don't know if your team advised you that if you go underneath the road, you would see that it's actually on further undermining underneath the road. And that's the only road that the residents in that area have to access their homes as the other road on the top is completely undermined. So you have a timeline for completion of this, Mr. Speaker? Let me confirm the timeline because I don't want to mislead. Mr. Speaker, and I can get that information back to the, the member. Thank you, and I appreciate your assistance on this, Minister. Question number seven. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please tell the Sambo House what is his ministry's plan to fix the exposed hole at the top of Georgia Hill Road? and leaking water line, which represents a serious hazard to the residents in the area, inclusive of timeline. Mr. Speaker, through uh, my ministry, through the Water and Sewage Department, they commence work on this Georgie Hill Road on the 3rd of March, and works are expected to be completed within one month's time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and one month time, um, excuse me. You said 3rd of March, which was? A couple of weeks last week or something. Last, last week. OK. And that's, that's inclusive of addressing the issue with the leaking pipe as well? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I don't want you to add to that $22, that $22 million of lost water revenue, because I see it been leaking now for some weeks now. <laughs> Question number eight. Mr. Speaker, uh, water expenditure, not revenue. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please tell us, Honorable House, A, if the residents of Greenland from Courtney Gardens' apartment leading to the top of Shepherd Hill to John Black's resident is currently getting public water, and B, if the answer is no, please advise what are the plans to address this issue and will the when will the residents of this area have access to the public water supply? Mr. Speaker, I am happy to report to this honorable house that the residents in the vicinity of Courtney, Courtney Gardens apartment to John Black's residence are receiving public water uh, for those that have actually applied. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, due to the uh, malfunctioning pump, there is currently one house located above John Black's resident who is not receiving water to water. The department is currently sourcing a replacement pad for the pump to resolve this issue. However, in the interim, the department is ex exploring an alternate option that will allow the water to reach uh, to that resident. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, because you know we don't want no residents left behind, and I, and I want to make sure that I will follow up with you subsequently to ensure that our resident has some kind of remedy um, to get water supply to their home. Um, additionally, there are some pipes which, which, are run, which will run above ground in that area. You said you don't run them up above ground. There are lots of pipes that are run above ground. I'm sorry, ground. Leader of Opposition, you're not, you're not working with me. I'm hearing statements again. Do you, have a, do you have a follow-up for the Honorable Minister? Yes, yes. Okay, let me hear the follow-up question. Mr. Speaker, there's a pipe or several pipes running above ground in that area. I think that could contribute to the issues that we're having in water in that area in terms of getting those, those, those pipes properly 
addressed? Uh, is there any plans to address those pipes that are running from the bottom of that hill up to the, the apex of the hill in that area? Well, Mr. Speaker, the timeline given to me regarding this area is, is one month. So if there, there are any issues within the area, I'm sure they should be and they will be remedied. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll follow up with you on those issues, Minister. Question number nine. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities please advise this Honorable House on the status of the installation of the water infrastructure in Sabbath Hill area from Hope Hill Church onwards to give access to the public water system for residents in the Sabbath Hill area? Mr. Speaker, the Water and Sewage Department has embarked upon a territory-wide plan to address the long-standing issues of new connection to the public water network. The, the Sabbath Hill area from Hope Hill Church onwards is included in this plan. Notwithstanding the challenges, though, Mr. Speaker, that we are currently facing with the COVID-19 global pandemic, this initiative, though it remains a high priority uh, for my ministry and this government. I thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your response. Is there any timeline for this particular project in that area? Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me confirm the timeline, but it's something that we have um, the detailed plans for. Then we work to get the, the, the entire process done, funding, and, and so forth. So let me confirm before I, I mislead on the timeline. Thank you, Minister. And I also want to thank the Minister for Transportation, Works, and Utilities for answering all the questions in kind. I thank you, sir. I thank the minister also for answering the questions. And I now ask the leader of the opposition and member for the 8th district to pose his questions to the minister for natural resources, labor, and immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Speaker, could the honorable minister for natural resources and labor, I mean, natural resources, labor, and immigration Please tell us, Honorable House, A, if the ministry has plans to build a finger pair dock at Red Bay for the fisher folks and other boaters of the Eastern Island community, B, if the answer is yes, when is this project scheduled to commence and be completed? C, if the answer is no, please tell us, Honorable House, why not? And D, what is the amount of money budgeted in the 2021 budget for this project? Thank you. What mic change? Sorry, Mr. Speaker, the microphone was giving some trouble. Okay. Mr. Speaker, on 4th November 2011, the then government of the Virgin Islands executed two contracts pertaining to the East End Fat Hawks Bay Development Project. Contract number PMO slash 005M slash 2011 was issued to Sanwise Limited for dredging and construction of concrete bulkhead and boat ramp at Red Bay in East End in the amount of $767,030. While contract number, number PMO slash 006M Slash 2011 was issued to Block Marine Construction Limited for the construction of a dock and placement of moorings at Red Bay East End in the amount of $425,000. Mr. Speaker, you realize that this was read before the elections of 2011, in which the said member asked the question was elected to office. Mr. Speaker, in 2014, works associated with contract number PMO slash 005M slash 2011 commenced and was completed in 2016. It should be noted, Mr. Speaker, that works pertaining to contract number PMO slash 006M slash 2011 Black Marine could not commence until a contract, until a concrete bulkhead was completed as a dock would be constructed from the bulkhead. Irrespective of the ministry's request for funding to construct the dock in 2016 and 2017, 
Funding was instead provided for another aspect of the project, the restoration of the Fat House Bay Beach. During the said period, Mr. Lawrence Block of Block Marine Construction Limited frequently contacted the minist this ministry concerning the works outlined in contract number PMO slash 006M slash 2011. He was continuously informed that due to financial constraints, the commencement of the project was met with much delay. Mr. Speaker, in 2019, after eight years of delay, the sum of $300,000 was provided in the 2019 budget estimates to commence works on the project. As such, a meeting was subsequently held with Lawrence Block, who indicated that he already had several projects scheduled and was therefore not in a position to commence the project until the latter part of 2019. As a follow-up to the meeting, in an unsigned correspondence dated 24 June 2019, which, which was acknowledged by the then Permanent Secretary, Mr. Block confirmed that a dock with cleats and skeleton can be constructed for the budgeted sum of $300,000 and indicated his payment schedule. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Block departed for the Netherlands thereafter. In preparation to commence a project on 18th October 2019, a site visit was conducted with Mr. Block on the 25th of October 2019. He presented a schedule of works. Mindful that the cost to complete the works of land in a contract had escalated over the years, Mr. Block was asked to confirm if the work stipulated in a contract can be completed for the contract sum. Mr. Speaker, on 20th October 2019, Mr. Block confirmed that a contracted sum of 425,000 can only construct the main jetty and T-head along with scouting and cleats. Therefore, he asked to submit a payment schedule which was received on 14th November 2019 in order to proceed with the request for the mobilization payment. Upon receipt, the payment schedule was followed to the Ministry of Finance and approval was given, was subsequently granted. Mr. Speaker, with financing of the project now in place, the Ministry was ready to commence the project when we came across issues of land ownership and with the contract. On 12 October 2020, Mr. Block wrote to me requesting that a settlement be mediated as the government was in breach of the contract. He once again wrote on 22nd January 2021, Mr. Speaker, once these matters are resolved, the ministry intends to construct a dock at Red Bay and once funding remains available. Mr. Speaker, the commencement and completion dates are to be determined. Mr. Speaker, the sum of $450,000 was made available in a 2021 budget estimate for construction of the dock at Red Bay. I thank you very kindly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for that comprehensive history of the project so that persons in the district um, and the community could understand the details behind of that. Uh, one follow-up question, Mr. Speaker, and uh, sure. I just want a matter of clarity in the, in the Minister's response. I just want to make sure that we, we put the accurate information on the record. The Minister said that the the dock couldn't be finished, couldn't be built until the bulkhead was completed. Is that correct? Mr. Speaker, yes, that is correct. Um, so it's impossible then for there be a H. You mentioned in your, in your statement that there was an H-year delay. If the bulkhead was finished at, in 2016 and in 2019 um, you got the funding, then between 2016 and 2019 is only three years, not an H-year delay, because it couldn't have started until the actual um, bulkhead was completed. So I just want to make sure for the record that's, that's clear. Speaker, point is taken. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources and Labor and Immigration please tell this Honorable House, A, how many applications have been received for the, of their names, place of residence, and how long they have lived in the Virgin Islands and where and, and Virgin Islands that were approved or denied. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question once more. Mr. Speaker, the issues surrounding status in this territory are long-standing debates that have been problematic for all sitting governments. These matters are firstly addressed at the level of legislation, such as the British Nationality Act, Immigration and Passport Act, Section 16 and 18, and by many policies put in place by successive governments to address these long-standing issues. Mr. Speaker, over the years, many attempts have been made by successive administrations to try and bring some level of fairness and balance in the administration of awarding status. Mr. Speaker, in 2004, during the NDP-led administration, an ad hoc committee was established to develop recommendations for the addressing of the backlog of applications, as well as to address the ongoing significant increase of persons becoming eligible for status. The recommendations made by the committee, still to this day, make up a vital part of the decision-making process. However, Mr. Speaker, it should be noted that many of those recommendations were never actualized, caused an even greater backlog and related issues. Mr. Speaker, as a private citizen, I was selected to serve on that committee in 2004. And it is quite ironic that 17 years later, the same issues continue to persist. Mr. Speaker, in early February 2019, prior to the general elections, an attempt was made to regularize persons through a fast-track program. However, only two categories were successful in making the list. Those who had made substantial domestic investments and those who had a substantial business presence, mainly in the financial services industry. Mr. Speaker, 71 persons at that time were awarded residence status, with a range from approximately four years to 25 years. It is important to highlight that the records reveal that there were no applications on file for some persons who received this status. The listing of these 71 persons is attached as Appendix 1. Mr. Speaker, in December 2019, the immigration regularization process took place to again, to again address those fast-track initiatives. Persons who lived within the territory for many years and had not had, a, had the opportunity to become regularized for varying reasons. This process was done in a manner to try to strike a balance while bridging the gap with what is legislated in both the British Nationality Act and the Immigration and Passport Act. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to clarify the matter of third generation belonging. As the Leader of the Opposition has stated, and what, and what was administered by the Immigration Department, which was fourth generation belongership. In the initial stages, it was publicized that the last fast track resolution process will entail a third generation belongership. However, it was later noted that this is already covered by the Constitution and is administered, currently administered by the Civil Registry and Passport Office. Therefore, the amendment to the Immigration and Passport Act was amended to speak of fourth generation, which means a person whose great-grandparents was born in the BVI. Also, Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that the fourth generation applications were processed in 2020 and not within the immigration regularization period of December 2019 due to lack of adequate manpower. As such, Mr. Speaker, a total of 1,321 applications for status under the Fast Track Immigration Regularization Program were received. Of that total, 320 applications were with the Immigration Department prior to the program and persons share the interest in being part of the fast-track immigration regularization process, as I'll call out now. Those with double residence and belong status, 487. Prior, 100. Belong status alone, 528. Prior, 120. Fourth generation, 86. For a total of 1101, and 220. 
Huh? Or, or, or 11.01, I don't understand. You could repeat the last 11.01. Yes, two, at 220. I'll be going to 1321 for you. The, okay. okay. Yeah, the list is there. Mr. So Speaker, of the 1,321 applications received, a total of 1,273 were processed and subsequently approved by Cabinet through the powers given in Section 2A and Section 3 of the Immigration and Passport Amendment Act 2019. The breakdown of these are as follows. Residents and, and belonging status, 487. Belonging status, 528. Four generation, 86. For a total of 1,273. Total approved during the fast track. Residents and belonging, 541. Belonging status, 648. Four generation, 84 for a total of 1,273. They're all in the attachments. Mr. Speaker, the list of applicants, inclusive of their names, places of residence, place of birth, and number of years residing in the Virgin Islands is provided to members as Appendix 2, which you shall get shortly. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any follow-up, Leader of the Opposition? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I have couple of follow-ups. Um, Mr. Speaker, in terms of this, these numbers that the minister called out, and I don't have the details in front of me, so I, it's difficult for me to, to say the numbers based on the specific numbers. I was trying to write as we go along, but I was unfortunate, unable to do so. How many of those individuals were granted under minister's discretion? I know that the process was very specific in terms of when we came to the house, um, 20 years, uh, it was 15 initially, and then we, we came to the house and discussed 20 years, and there's some specific criteria, as you mentioned in your statement, how, under which you would be able to grant minister's discretion. How many of those individuals were granted under minister's discretion and were resident within a territory less than five years? If you have that information readily available. Mr. Speaker, I can assure him that none were granted any status under minister's discretion. A few might have been granted under cabinet's powers to do so, in sec under section 16 and 18 of the Immigration and Passport Act. But I do not have the specific number with me. So the, the details, thank you, Minister. The, so the details in terms of the years of individuals yes, sir, in, is in the, all listed in, in, in the document? All listed in the, yes. Okay. All right. Oh. In the attachments, which, which are here. You'll get them shortly. For every single one that we could find. Uh, I guess I'll have to ask my, I, I, have, I don't have it for rules, so I can't really ask any follow-up questions, but I thank the minister for his response to the questions, and I look forward to um, if there's any potential future questions. Um, yeah, let me ask this one question, though, minister. Um, was anyone who had status, who was in the territory 18 or 19 years turned away, um, and denied, denied um, the ability to be able to be part of the process? I don't have the list in front of me, but some were denied. I could not tell you at this point how, many, how much time they had been here. You get a, the appendix in a minute, and you'll see for yourself. It's all on, in the appendix. So this is it contract? This is it? This is it? When the, where is the list? I don't see the list. Yeah, I don't see the list. I don't see the list. You have exhausted your two, but I'll allow you if you have the information now and you have one more. I will allow it. Leader of the opposition. No, no. <coughs> Did you get the answers? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. What's, what's the challenge? I'll, 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 ask, I'll ask a subsequent question to get the additional information because I don't seem to have the list is. is and to peruse, peruse this list in this short space of time is, is virtually impossible. So, Mr. Speaker, I, okay. I'll, I'll rest in terms of my You'll questions to the minister statement. at this time. Okay. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for Natural Resources and Labor for being very detailed and responding to the questions in time.
I thank the Minister for Natural Resources for answering the question. I now invite the Leader of the Opposition to pose his question to the Minister, Minister for Health and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell us Honorable House? Honorable Premier, you recognize your point of yeah, information? Just, just a point of clarification. I normally don't get involved in question and answers when I leave my domain. But I was trying to understand if the leader of opposition is saying that we give settlers to persons that were here under five years. Is, is that, was that something that you were, you were uh, concluding? I didn't conclude anything. I asked a question. Oh, you asked a question? I didn't oh, so it wasn't a conclusion. <laughs> okay, because I know it didn't exist. So I, was, I, was, I, I wasn't clear if it was a conclusion, and I wasn't clear what the answer was. But at least it is no, so I, I'm clear now. Uh, the speaker is clear that I should not make statements or epithets. I should ask questions, and I asked a question, a very specific question. OK. Well, you got an answer to it, though? Not yet. But Under five years? Well, 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 I'll, 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 I just got the report, so I, I'm not going to. I've moved on. I've no, moved no, on. no, I don't want to make sure it's clear, because no. these things are on the air. You were talking about the, your fast track program before election or ours? I've moved on from it. Okay. Because I know your fast track has people under Mr. five speaker. years. Honorable members. Honorable okay. members. Sorry. My that. fast track program. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, what is yeah. this? You were part of the government? Honorable members, the question was asked and answers, and I think the minister for the subject said that the answer is in what was handed out. So let's move on. Mr. Speaker, what good for the goose should be good for the gang. Honorable leader of the opposition. Okay, the, let's move on. That's all I can say. And did you Mr. read your speaker, question already? Can I ask my question? Sure, you can. OK. Mr. Speaker, question number one. Hello. Mr. Speaker, could the Hello. Premier, see, he getting up, he getting up to ask a question. So I think it's here I ask the question him too. No, your, your question is to the Minister for Health and Social so, Development. You're showing the Premier, Mr. Speaker? Uh, Cause, cause I, I'm, myself, I'm myself lost. Let, let's move on. Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell the Sample House if the frontline health care workers have been paid the additional stipend that was promised to them? A. If the answer is no, why not? B. How much is owed and what has been paid? And C. When will, they be recti when will this be rectified if you have not already? Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition for the um, question. I will answer it, but I must get this little piece in, in the answer. The stipend that was promised to them, the stipend that was promised to them. I'm not sure where the official documentation on that is, but I'll answer the question. Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, the Health Services Authority is a statutory body governed by a board of directors. You are also aware that the fight against the COVID-19 virus involved multiple government agencies, statutory bodies, and private individuals and corporations. Any decisions related to remunerations and stipends is the sole responsibility of the board of directors of the Health Services Authority. Mr. Speaker, according to information provided by the BVI Health Services Authority, frontline health care workers were granted a one-off payment approved by the Board of Directors based on criteria established by the authority. The funds approved by the Board for this purpose was $113,000. Mr. Speaker, full payment, I'm informed, were made on June 15, 2020, to cover the period approved by the board. Mr. Speaker, um, I am unaware that there's anything further to be rectified. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, am I to understand that the lab technicians and all the frontline workers who work overtime, are they being paid overtime? at the Health Services Authority, or this is part of their regular duties during the COVID era? 
is a word I always get wrong. The specificity of the details of what was approved by the Board of Directors wasn't asked. So I can't say exactly all of who was approved and the conditions under which it was approved. But um, since you were well informed, you can then provide me the information and then I'll be able to, to do it. But I do know that I, I am informed that the Board of Directors, based on criteria established by them, were able to get a number of areas done. And I might add that when you come to this COVID-19 pandemic, this global pandemic, from the community workers, healthcare services, border patrol, environmental health, public health, it is an issue that we can't skirt over. There are a lot of hard working people who have done this. And as a House of Assembly, we will have to find ways in which a number of persons, even in the, sorry, not even in, in addition, GIS and all of the other areas, they would have to look at. So it's a very important question. But in terms of, um, in terms of this specific, this question as posed, we have a lot of work to do in terms of rewarding or giving incentives to the hard working statutory bodies, government agencies, and private individuals who have worked hard and long in getting this done. Another statement? Does it answer to the question? Okay. Mr. Speaker, I wasn't sure if the minister was making another statement. So I just wanted to make sure that he's not making a statement. I'm happy he clarified. Okay. Mr. Mr. Speaker, can the, so the minister is unavailable, unaware to, you, you, you don't have, you're saying you don't have the details of this as this, or can you provide the details to the Samuel House? Or do I need to come back in a subsequent question to get the details? Mr. Speaker, the, the question posed, could the Minister for Health and Social Development please tell this Honorable House <clears throat> if the frontline healthcare workers have been paid the additional stipend that was promised? It, there's a lot of inferences in there because the definition of frontline workers is in there, and I don't want to get in that particular mix in that trap in terms of the, now he's. He has, he has gone to where he is now asking about the lab technicians. What about the community division? What about those that are swabbing? What about the other frontline people? So we're not splitting hair on this, but it's just in terms of what details were asked of me is what I'm trying to give. So if you have specifics, in terms of who you define as the front line health care workers. Because I will tell you, the entire organization down there, they worked. So it's just an answer to the question again, Mr. Speaker, not a statement. But I'm just, um, I'm, I'm trying the best to answer the questions as posed. But if you want specifics of it, then the answer is yes. Bring back what you reckon is front line and I will get the authority and the board of directors to furnish me all of the answers to the questions. Mr. Speaker, I'm very aware of the question because I wrote it. Um, so I didn't need a minister to give me that, that long sequelae. But, um, and all you had to say was yes or no. And, and, I got, and I got my answer, yes, that I need to bring back another question and I Truly. will bring a subsequent question to get a detail. Uh, question number two. Mr. Speaker, could the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development please advise this Honorable House if the housing situation with an individual living at the sticket in Long Look was addressed? A, if the answer is no, please advise why not? And B, what steps is being, are being taken to help this individual? Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to address this 
question. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health and Social Development through the Social Development Department continues to conduct outreach to this certain individual, District 8 voter, that appears to spend extended periods of time in the vicinity of the sticket in Longo. The individual in question continues to be reminded of the housing options currently available, including family accommodations and residence at the Safe Haven Transitional Center, which is the facility established by the government to meet the needs of individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. In addition, Mr. Speaker, during my last six responses of this person in this honorable house on similar questions, I had mentioned that the ministry is also exploring community-based long-term housing solutions for persons of limited means who do not have access to private property. Mr. Speaker, the member will be pleased to learn that the ministry has successfully negotiated and have agreed with a landlord to acquire property in Longwood to build a fit for purpose facility for this individual and others in similar circumstances in that community where persons can be accommodated. This transaction was facilitated and followed through by the, by the Honorable Representative for the 7th District. Mr. Speaker, social housing has been a long-standing issue in this territory that has been even more compounded by the catastrophic events of 2017. Despite this fact, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry will continue to allocate available resources and pursue alternatives that would ultimately aim to address the pervading issue. And I'm sure I'll be given a chance to expand further in a minute. Speaker, I'm just, just not my follow-up yet, but I just, there's a section of the question that was missed in terms of, hold on, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell this honorable house, and, and I want to make sure we clarify, so I don't know why the, the minister felt the need to say he's a District 8 voter. I thought the minister is responsible for the territory, so it don't matter where they vote. In fact, the member is a 7 district voter um, and, and, and not a District 8 voter, just for, for make sure we clarify that first and foremost. But you're a territorial member, minister, and you need to look out for all the people of this territory. So I just want to make sure I put that on the record. Um, is is there, is, what is the timeline for finalizing this entire process? to get this individual into a home. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I, um, the member is off um, quite keen to note that the 7th and 8th, and I know because I'm, I'm keenly aware 7th and 8th work close hands and gloves. So together with the honorable men um, representative for the 7th district, the lands just very, um, I guess you can call it the southwest from the sticket itself, or just immediately west of the sticket, was purchased right next to lands owned by government. The, the whole time frame, because the land, the purchase, where we're going to build this, is the particular issue. All of the options of where the person can live is being refused, I am told. So the fact is, is that we can continue to offer and offer temporary housing. And I will see in terms of uh, working together with yourself, uh, members of the 7th and 8th, to make sure if we can convince the families or convince the person that this is an opportunity for him to be assisted in other ways, like we have done for other persons in the 7th and we'll do, sorry, done in the 7th, done in the 8th and all through the territory. Mr. Speaker, we know of the circumstance that persists with the individual at the spot, and we know of the, of the um, challenges that we have with the individual. We know of what is being done to further this along. So I'm saying to you that 
for the sixth, uh, maybe seventh time now, we will address this, but there are some issues, I am told, related to the person and the acceptance, save for the fact that we are not prepared to get the individual forcefully removed in other ways. But if you have other ideas, like the member for the seven, <coughs> who has been working on this, you can have the questions answered other than here on the floor. I will be pleased. I'll, I can do this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I, I thought I heard that the land situation was resolved. Yes. So the land situation is resolved. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of floored that, that, that where we are in the process because you, you're looking at the, uh, what I understand, those homes are about 20 by 20. They're not big homes, they're small homes. And, and I saw that we built a, a 70 by 60 welcome center at B5 in 45 days. And, and I'm here, as you said, for a sixth consecutive time asking this question over two years. And we can't get a 20 by 20 home built for a homeless person. And we got a 70 by 60 building built and furnished in 45 days. So I am willing to work to ensure that this individual gets into a home, even if it means engaging contractors and we're doing it ourselves because I pass him every day on the way to my, to my house. It has nothing to do with a vote. He can't vote for me. So I will again implore that we do something to fast track this process of getting this member into a home and not being exposed under the sticket on a daily basis. Mr. Speaker, I'll take the higher level and not address that statement because we don't want anyone going out the hall today. Yes. 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 How long have you been passing there, you say, for the past 10 years? Yes. We'll get it done. Do you have a final question? I, we won't, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, we won't have to go across the hall. Both of us have, have um, descendants down in Fat Hogs Bay, so I think we, we resorted that. But at the end of the day, we need to ensure that the people of this territory yes get the support and relief that they need. And I continue to ask this, and not just for this member, but for other members in the territory who are experiencing similar circumstances. But I see this particular individual, and I think we need to figure out a way to fast track this. And I will have a discussion with yourself and the member for the 7th District to ensure that we fast track this process. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank you for the ability to ask my questions unencumbered somewhat in the house today, and I want to thank all the ministers uh, for answering the questions in kind. I thank you. Thank you for your question to the government. And members, you would have recalled my apologies on behalf of the member for the second district, who is still out today. So his questions will revert to the next convenient sitting of the House of Assembly. With that said, brings to the end of the questions and answer, I call upon the clerk. Item number nine, other business. I recognize the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. First, I'd like to say good afternoon to the entire Virgin Islands, and also God's blessing to everyone. Song of my voice. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I stand here today, and I'm not going to be long. I'm always a sharp-winded one. My, my colleagues know that. So I know we've been here for four days. Four days we'll be here, Mr. Speaker, doing the people's work. But Mr. Speaker, I, I stand today to say a few things that a lot of people might not want to address, and they don't want to say it. But like I said before, I come to this honorable house to do a job, not to be popular, but to speak the truth. But before we go that far, Mr. Speaker, I want to first say, encourage people to, come, to, to listen and to come out if, if they can, or, or I don't think they can, to support our youth parliament, Mr. Speaker. We have some brilliant young people in the youth parliament who will be 
during a debate on Thursday at 5 p.m. at Save the Seed. And the topic that they will be debating is a very hefty one. It is based on what it would, what, let me see what the what is. What would and or, let me make sure I have what right. Let me have my glasses and see what's in the speaker. Because it's, it's about, it was us talking about towards full self-determination, Mr. Speaker. That's a hefty topic for our young people to be debating on. But I know that we have some very intelligent young people who will do justice to this debate. So I'm encouraging everyone to listen in. I think before we close, I know the speaker, you'll give the details of how you can hear it and when. So I would like the people to support the young people because we have to encourage them to continue to be a part of what's going on around them. Mr. Speaker, I also want to talk about some of the bills that we brought here, these four cities. We brought over 30 bills in this, in this sitting, Mr. Speaker. Out of the 30 of them, we had about nine of them, I think, was second and third readings. Mr. Speaker, we have to do a better job when it comes to getting the public involved in some of these bills and understand what these bills are about, Mr. Speaker. We have to create some sort of system that these people could call in and get information or somebody could talk to them about what some of the bills mean, the meaning behind some of them, Mr. Speaker. Because when we don't put these things in place, we're leaving our people behind, Mr. Speaker. And it's it making the process for us even harder to get things done because if they don't understand what we're here trying to get out, how Will we get the system to work faster? It's going to take longer, Mr. Speaker. I spoke about it already. And we have to find some way, some way that we could have whether it's an office that people call in and get this information, or even when some of the same laws are being passed by some of the same departments, if they have an individual who could, who could be the one to sit down and explain and get things out there, so people can understand. I know, it, I know that we put it in the Gazette. But Mr. Speaker, we got to go further than that. Because if we want to really get all people involved and understand what we are doing here, we have to help them. It's not everyone that listens to the House Assembly. Not everyone. It's not everyone that takes up a, a, a newspaper and read, Mr. Speaker. So I think we need to reach out and try to get a lot of the laws that we make and a little easier to understand. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to touch on a topic also that's very touchy to everyone, but everybody's free to touch it. And that's this blogging, Mr. Speaker. The blogging in the newspapers. Look okay, at the online blogging. Mr. Speaker, we are hurting ourselves. That's what we're doing. Everything that we put in those blogs are all over the wall. It's not just here. You're not hurting me, Mr. Speaker. But you're hurting yourself. You understand? When you, when you sit down and you read a lot of these blogs, which I don't really read them, but when I see them, I, 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 I applaud. We're talking about freedom of speech. Mr. Speaker, there's a difference between freedom of speech and definition of character. You could go and you could call me a fool if you want. That's OK. But when you go, you start talking things about me being a criminal or a thief, that is wrong, Mr. Speaker. And there's laws in place that this don't happen. But here again, we do not, Mr. Speaker, we do not turn and do what we're supposed to do. Enforcement, Mr. Speaker. We are passing a heap of laws here and there's no enforcement. OK? We, as government, are here making laws, but we can't enforce the laws. The enforcement has to do their job, Mr. Speaker. And with that, I'm going to talk about this set of crime that's happening and the drugs and 
what's taking place and everybody's blaming the government. How can you blame the government for this? There's laws in place. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you a funny, a funny joke. Let me ask you a question. The drugs are made here? No. The drugs stay in here? No. They come in from somewhere, Mr. Speaker, and going somewhere. But they have to pass more than one different stop before they reach here. They don't have security as well. So I'm trying to figure out why are we getting the blame for this? And it have to pass through all ah, sorts of different areas before you reach here. But when they reach here, it'd be very the biggest drug place in the world. Can anybody give me the, the ratio or the, the a list of how many drug addicts we have in the BBI? Do we have any? Do we have a rehab center that have people who days on drugs? Sell them, Mr. Speaker. Not if you want to say we have a couple of people who drink alcohol, is, is there. But we have to stop furnishing and, 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 and putting ourselves in a situation where it is we keep it talking, we don't on each other, Mr. Speaker. You calling on the government about stuff that we are not responsible for. Yes, we respond because it is government, but we are not the ones who they're supposed to turn around and, and, and enforce the law. Mr. Speaker, I ain't going today. I'm going to call out the commission police today. I'm going to call him out. And I'm going to tell him he needs to come to the public in two days, Mr. Speaker, and give us a plan what he has to fight crime right now and what's going on in the BVI. I'll give him two weeks, Mr. Speaker. But he needs to come with a plan to the people to say how we're going to fight this crime. We had five or more deaths, murders, just the other day. What are we hearing? But people are going to say they wait to see what the government is going to do. What the government could do? We already put things in place. Mr. Speaker, once again, I'm going to ask a question. What is the succession plan of the Commissioner of Police? I asked that question before in standing finance. I haven't seen none of them now. Mr. Speaker, we need to stop putting blame on ourselves. And I keep saying, if we do not live in unity and in Virgin Islands, we're going to lose it all. I turned around the other day and I made a statement, a question I asked, Mr. Speaker, in this house. I asked a question because we were talking about electronic this and electronic that. And I seen a blog everybody talking about sheep is a this, sheep is a that. But the good thing I like, if you want to say something good, nobody can talk about it. So that's good. I know they're listening. So I like that. But Mr. Speaker, I was talking about we have students that went to school who have to get disrupted to come home to vote. I ain't talking about opening up the, the range for, for everybody to come and vote here. Let's think. Let's think before we speak, Mr. Speaker. Let's think. And that brings me right back to the bloggers, Mr. Speaker. I want to hold the newspapers accountable because the people type what they want, yes, they can say what they want, but the newspapers need to get together and come up with a proper plan of how you're going to deal with blogs because you're killing the Virgin Islands. You're killing yourself, people. Sit down and think on what we're doing. You know why it's like you have parliamentary people here speaking and you up there talking this and talking that. If you feel some way about somebody, you have to watch what you say. Mr. Speaker, I'm one of the few BBI landers who they love everyone. I don't have a hate in my bone for a soul, Mr. Speaker. Don't care if you talk bad about me, or you say someone be, it, 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 that's, that's your thing. But I love everyone. If I see somebody crossing the road and I can help, I can help them, whether they don't like me or not, nobody's because that's BBI love. That's what our forefathers bring us upon. 
That BBI love, Mr. Speaker. We need to get it back. We cannot continue going on the road with going people. We're losing it. We come here every day, we fight. If I see my brother, you need to bring him up. How much time you keep your own down? We cannot continue living the life our forefathers die and sweat for us to have this country. And we're going to sit down here and we're going to let it go because we always envy each other. People afraid to say it, they're going to say it. That's what's going on here. We envy each other. And we have to stop. How much, how much time? How much time do you think we have on this earth? God gave us a time. And it has to be used to use it to help each other, not to pick each other down. Mr. Speaker, it hurts. It hurts that when I could go and I could see and read the stuff that people are having out there saying, it's wrong. It's wrong, and there's a law in place to protect us. We have to, we have to do the right thing, Mr. Speaker. The people who need to enforce these things have to get up and enforce the laws. We have our young people looking at us for leadership. And then when we try to lead, it ain't everything that we might say is right. But you can't keep on knocking on everything you hear somebody say, man. Why? Why we so? I didn't come here, I, I, I came here because I want to make a difference in people's lives. And the difference what I want to make is to make sure that I could keep my brother up. And I'm asking and I'm begging everyone a song of my voice to let's stop fighting each other. Let's unite. You can't see what's going on here? You, you mean to tell me we cannot see what's actually taking place right now? Everybody could see. If it sounds like a body, it's yes, because of body, because I want us to stop fighting each other. That's why I say what I'm saying. I think God put me here for a reason. And he put me in this house for a reason. You understand? And ain't no one or nobody going to silence me when I'm speaking for the people. And when I try to find ways to better us in the Virgin Islands. So all y'all who out there want to blog and say this and say that, go right ahead. So guess what? God put me here to do something. And I'm going to continue to do what I have to do. We need to stop. Stop. Stop calling on our own. Because if I turn on and I tell the, 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 the deputy, the deputy um, premier, oh, you're going to sense, um, and somebody heard me tell him that, a child heard me tell me that, a child was there, I teach him a child the wrong thing, and that's what we keep at doing. So every time you put something negative in the newspaper, anywhere, about any individual, you're speaking about yourself. That's what we keep doing. We keep speaking about ourselves, no matter how we put it. It's about us. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, my people, you may come to me for help. It ain't about who you vote for. It ain't about no NDP, no VIP, no DIP. It's about people. It's about people. That's why I got up and I spoke today. Because I, I'm, I'm tired and I'm sick. Of winters, you, you, you look and you hear people, we fighting each other all the time. They have certain people who hear now in the Virgin Islands. And if you look at what's going on around us, they're going to tag up together. They're going to team up together. I ain't calling no names, I ain't calling no race, I ain't calling nothing, but we all know. They're going to tag up together to get something done. But we as black people want to go do things on our own. We can't afford to run a company, a, a open a company, but we're going to force ourselves to open a company because we want all for ourselves. But other people are going to come and they're going to tag up together, five of them, and open that company. I don't see what's going on. 
You don't see it? So how long, people, how long are we going to stay here and take this? They call it mental slavery. That's what we have. Wake up, people. Wake up. Wake up and unite. Stop keeping each other down. This is one BVI. Embrace each other like brothers and sisters. That's all I'm asking for. That's all. I'm going to go back to the blogs so I ain't finish. Because I want the newspaper to, they have to come up with a plan. There's a simple plan. Come up with something simple that you could identify who come in. Because look, if you can't put your name to something and tell the truth, man, go sit down. If the truth is the truth, come and speak your mind. There's nothing wrong with it. But come and be honest with the people and say what you have to say. I'm always good for criticism, you know, because one thing I learned, good criticism and bad criticism, you have to learn by your mistakes. You know, but there's a way, there's a way of doing things. You can't every, you can't every second be fighting each other down. We cannot continue fighting each other down. We're not setting a good example for our young people. I have some grandchildren, and I want to see my grandchildren go through this, Go through the same thing, I go through lawn while lawn. Go and catch a fish in them hand. That's what I want to see happen. That's why, that's why I live for now. I, I don't live, I live for my grandchildren, my children. That's what I live for. I want to see them grow up and enjoy what we enjoy. That's what I want to see happen. And I think every person in this room wants to see that same thing. Everybody in the people want, should want to see that same thing. I see we have some, some people out taking videos of people in a fight. It need to stop. Mr. Speaker, it need to stop. Why are, we, why are we embarrassing our own people? Three young ladies out there, you see them embarrassing them, and you, you, we up and on posting these things. It is wrong. And that's why I say the enforcers have to enforce. Mr. Speaker, Earlier, I, I, I heard my colleague, Honorable, say something. And I like what he said in one of his questions. He asked, there's a lot of people that need help and asking for help. And it's true. I ain't staying too long, but two minutes. I need two minutes gone, right? Okay. There's a lot of people out there asking for help and need help. We all know that. But Mr. Speaker, my question, how can we help everyone? That's my question. How can we help everyone? And my answer is this. We are trying. But remember, God also tried to help everyone. He didn't get it do. He did not get it done. Remember that. But guess what? He tried. And that's what this government is doing. We are trying to help everyone. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help everyone. But guess what? When Moses passed the Red Sea, trying to save everyone, some get left behind. He did not want to kill it, but they get left behind. So what I'm trying to say is that we want to help everyone, but it might not happen that way. But we're going to try. And Mr. Speaker, with that, I'm going to leave it with that that this government is going to try their best to help everyone. We're not going to leave no one behind. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I thank the territorial member and deputy speaker for his contributions. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Hearing no one, I call upon the clerk. Item number 10, adjournment. Is there anyone moving a motion to adjourn? Adjourn Saturday. Come on, come get up, get up. Hey, Joe. For me to get up and second my good brethren.
because I was getting the feeling that he wanted to be here a little longer, so I didn't want to deprive him of any more time. So now since he has moved that motion and we have had such brief remarks and speech by the Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I've noticed since he's taking the vaccine, he's speaking a lot more. So if the second shot comes, I don't know. We probably have to leave other business to him alone. So Mr. Speaker, on that, I, I want to join with, the, with everyone to support our young people tomorrow in the youth parliament. They have been doing this independent of any political interference of us as elected members. So the topic is one that they um, have, have, uh, that has been selected not by any one of us in here as the, as the topic. So Mr. Speaker, let's come and enjoy and hear what our young people have to say because they're not the future of tomorrow, they're the future of today. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just say before we vote on the motion, remind, join with the Premier and the Deputy Speaker to remind everyone about the debate with the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament. The topic is, should the Virgin Islands move to self-determination? It's going to be 5 p.m. right here. The young parliamentarians will be taking their seat in the chambers, and it's going to be aired live on ZBVI 780, CBN Radio, Flow TV, and also the Government and the House of Assembly Facebook pages. The seating is limited, so those who can't physically come, make sure to tune in. With that said, a motion has been moved and seconded to adjourn. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. This house is now adjourned. Signy die. So I get in trouble. Hello? 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 Check. Check. Two. Two. System. Check. 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 One. One. Two. Check. Check. Yeah. Two. Two. Okay. Check two, two, two. Check, check, check. Two.